Greetings everyone. Welcome to this very special edition of the Creepy Fox True Scary Stories Podcast. The show in the series where we go ahead and relive and retell subscriber stories that have been sent in by all of you. And what a way to end 2021. Throughout this year we've received a multitude of stories from subscribers like yourselves from all around the world. By listening to these stories, we've learned valuable lessons of the real-life world and being aware of our surroundings. So, with that said, let's go ahead and relive some brand new scary stories, as well as some of the best of 2021. Enjoy. Before I begin with my submission, here's some contextual information on me. This is from the perspective of a 5'3", 120-pound female and I was 22 at the time of this incident. Now let me begin with the scary story. Being a pizza delivery driver is quite the interesting title, might you agree? Don't get me wrong. It's a job, and with the occasional generous customer giving you a pretty nice tip, you might have some evenings where you could potentially walk away with an extra $100. Those nights were very rare. But when it did happen... It sure helped pay for bills and other necessities. I'm describing my line of work from the mid-2000s, where I was employed for a mom-and-pop pizza store as a side hustle. Normally, I worked in the evenings and was off close to 11 p.m., occasionally going to midnight on rare instances when we were really busy. Anyways, I had been on the job for no more than six months, and it started my shift just like any other. After three to four deliveries, I ended up getting an order for a large cheese pizza that was on the other side of town. It would take me roughly 20 minutes to get there. Kind of annoying, but at least it gave me some time to listen to music. When I pulled up into the neighborhood, this taking place just a couple of weeks before Halloween, I was taken aback by all the wonderful decorations on the homes. Pumpkins, Props, lights, you name it. The house I arrived at for the delivery, however, was pretty boring. No lights or decorations whatsoever. In fact, it looked pretty run down compared to the other homes. Then again, this was in an older part of the city, but at least the other homeowners appeared to keep their homes in tip-top shape. I digress. I pulled up into the driveway and got immediately spooked by two of the largest pet bulls I'd ever encountered in my life. If it wasn't for the fence holding them back, I'm pretty sure they would have torn this calm, cool, and collected pizza delivery driver into a million pieces. Anyways, I walked up to the door and knocked. Ten seconds later, this really tall, middle-aged man holding a coarse light opens the door and then looks down at me and gives me one of the creepiest smiles I'd ever seen. I tried to hand him the pizza box, but he kept on insisting I come in and drop the pizza off in the living room table. Now, it's very rare we pizza delivery drivers ever enter people's homes, and the only time I actually did it was on a couple of occasions when the homeowners were elderly and couldn't carry the boxes of pizza being delivered. This was no elderly man, and he needed no such help with carrying a pizza box. I kept on insisting he just take the pizza, but it was clear he wasn't going to pay me unless I actually did as he said. I wasn't sure what was worse, being yelled at by the boss for not getting the payment, or being yelled at by this customer for not doing as he wished. Now, I know looking back, this was probably the dumbest decision of my life, And trust me, you don't have to tell me twice. I know this was just naive. I actually went ahead and took a step into his home. Not all the way, but just enough to get a better look of his living room. The place was a mess. There were used paper plates and cups scattered across the floor, stains on the carpet, bags of potato chips half open, and this overall smell that almost made me barf. Another thing I saw was a little table next to me with a lamp, and this is when I decided to place the pizza box there. The man yelled at me and told me to come in further and place the pizza on the other table that's further in the living room. 
but at this point, I didn't care if I was going to get yelled at by the boss. I stepped back, and as soon as I did, the man tries to grab me, but his grasp just misses my t-shirt, and I feel his warm breath just inches from my neck. I booked it toward my vehicle, and the last sight I see was the man just staring at me from the front porch, with this look of defeat. I was expecting my boss to give me a hard time, but after I explained my creepy encounter, he was very understanding. We ended up calling the police, but nothing really came out of it, which sucks because it really affected me quite greatly. I'm almost positive he was going to try and lock the door as soon as I stepped in all the way into his living room. Anyone with an imagination can only begin to think of all the possible outcomes, and that's just really scary to think about. In any case, I quit the very next day, and I have never delivered pizza again. I was working as a pizza delivery driver in Southern California back from 1991 to 1993. While each of my deliveries of super, crunchy, tender, delicious pizza went without a hint of creepy, there was one delivery in particular I will never forget to this day. It's actually one of the reasons to why I put in my two weeks and quit the job. Let me explain what had happened, along with the events leading up to the incident. I had clocked in at approximately 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, just an hour after I had my last class for the day, and I was met by my co-worker, we will call Isabella. She was catching me up on that day's shenanigans and even offered to cover some of my shift if I was too tired to work. I can recall she was trying to earn some extra money and get more hours for the holidays. I actually went ahead and accepted the hours, and our manager changed our off times, so I was only working four out of my six-hour shift. Anyways, fast forward to approximately an hour before I'm set to clock out early. The shop was quiet. It's just Isabella, our manager Mary and I, and we're passing the time just talking about random things. Eventually, we ended up receiving a phone call for an order, and I went ahead and offered to go and make the delivery, since I wanted to get out of the shop for a bit. We quickly prepare the medium pepperoni pizza, and then I hop into the delivery vehicle. Fifteen minutes later, Excited to take a break from the smell of sauce and cheese. The house I was delivering to was in a pretty sketchy neighborhood. There was one home, from what I remember, having bullet holes and yellow police caution tape over the front of the home that made that neighborhood even more notorious. I tried not to really think too much of it, since I was more focused on being able to clock out and head back home so I could take a nice hot long shower and try to relax from all the lectures and studies I had done earlier that day. As I pulled up into the cul-de-sac, a light rain hitting my windshield, I couldn't help but get this really strange feeling in my stomach. It's like my sixth sense was warning me of danger, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. When I parked and stepped out of my vehicle, I noticed a tall hooded figure standing at the side of the house and appearing to be looking into one of the windows. I, for whatever reason, chose to walk over to them and ask if they were the ones who had made the delivery request. You know, since I made the assumption they were the homeowner. I called out my presence in a calm and quiet fashion, and when the hooded figure turns around, that's when I went cold. Their face was covered with a ski mask, and the look in their eyes pretty much told me the whole story. What happens next is one of the scariest things to ever happen to me, and I just pray and hope this will never happen to any of you. The dude pulls out a gun and then instructs me that I am to make no sort of noise or bring attention to him, otherwise he was going to clap me right there and then. He didn't have to worry about that, however, since I was too scared to speak anyways. Well, clearly caught red-handed, he ended up looking in every direction in a paranoid fashion before booking it past me, then across the street, disappearing behind a couple of homes. 
I had no idea what to think in that moment, other than to knock on the homeowner's door and ask them to call the cops. A woman, pregnant, from what I remember, answers, and I then proceed to explain there was a man outside her home with a gun. I don't really think she believed me at first. She quickly changed her attitude and ushered me in so that she could call for help. About eight officers came rolling into the cul-de-sac less than ten minutes later, and I remember them doing this full-on search trying to locate this home burglar. Unfortunately, they never did find him, and his identity remained a mystery. I returned back to the pizza shop. I'd called my manager to explain what was taking place, and when I got there, that's when I finally broke down. My manager complimented me on my bravery and said that there was nothing for me to be ashamed of. Thankfully, one of the greatest parts of working at that location was how friendly my manager Mary was, as she gave me a few days to try and recover from that scary and bizarre incident. But as I mentioned in my intro, I ended up putting in my two weeks and quitting just a short time later. I have since lost touch with Mary and Isabella, and I do hope they're doing okay. Thanks in advance for featuring my story, Creepy Fox. It's greatly appreciated, and I hope you have yourself a happy new year. So, a little background. Back when I was still working for Disneyland in Anaheim, before our closure in March of 2020, I worked as a ticket taker slash park greeter. Every day I'd ride my bicycle to and from work, and I'd been enjoying the exercise for my year and a half of employment. Now, it's not that I couldn't afford a car. I just really enjoyed the exercise and thought driving two miles to work was pointless, since I could avoid the annoying traffic. Well, let me go back to one evening, right after I'd clocked out of work. It was 11.40 p.m. It had started to rain, and I couldn't wait to get back to my house, so I could enjoy the next two days off, just watching Netflix and laying in my bed. I almost considered calling my dad and asking him to do me the favor of picking me up, but he had work the next morning, and he had to be up by 5 a.m. I really didn't want to be too much of a bother. Therefore, I toughened up, and I tell myself just to hurry, and I'll be home in no time. So, I begin making my way towards Santa Ana, south of Disneyland. The first mile and a half goes by fairly normally, albeit I'm cold and wet, even with my work poncho on. Then, as if things couldn't have gotten worse, the rain begins to pick up, and then the chain on the bicycle starts to malfunction. Yes, of all times, it had to be then. Well, that was dumb. I opted to walk over to a gas station so I could let the rain settle for a while, as well as have an opportunity to fix my bicycle. First thing was first, however. I wanted something warm. Therefore, I parked my bicycle under the cover of the roof. Then I walked in and asked the cashier if they had hot chocolate. They sure did, and he begins to prepare it as I try to dry off next to a heater. Fast forward about 10 minutes and I finally got a break from the rain. It had now dwindled to a light sprinkle. This was my opportunity. So I returned back to my bicycle, still drenched from the downpour, and I begin to quickly put the chain back on its track. As I'm distracted, however, I hear footsteps make their way toward me. I made the assumption it was just somebody looking to get something from inside the convenience store. However, when I looked up, it was this homeless man. I proceeded to say hello as he just stands there and looks at me on my bicycle with this really weird look. It's like he was completely out of it or something. So I ignored him and I try to get onto my bicycle. Before moments later, he pushes me off. What's the big deal? What's your problem? I scream back at him, trying to keep my composure. But he responds by taking out a knife. And that's when my evening goes from bad to worse. I knew in that moment a bicycle wasn't worth being attacked for, so I kind of just stood there as he got onto it and tried to get away. Now, remember how I was trying to fix the chain just a minute earlier? Turns out I hadn't done a great job, as just a few seconds later he falls over, 
and gets drenched in a puddle. I used this opportunity to grab the attention of someone who had just pulled up into the empty gas station, and this creep just makes a run for it, going across the street. I did manage to call the cops and give them a pretty good description, and thank goodness it didn't take them too long to have their guy. When all was said and done, I called my dad who almost had a panic attack when I explained what had happened, but I was finally able to get back home close to 1.30am, relieved, albeit tired, and ready for a long hot shower. This took place in the summer of 2011, when I went to visit my older cousin, who lives in Southern California. For some context, I'm female, and I was 19 years old. Now, in total, I vacationed at my cousin's house for roughly two weeks, in which she took me to a bunch of fun and exciting places. Some of the obvious ones being the Santa Monica Pier, the Observatory, Angel Stadium, and Disneyland. Now, even though those adventures were fun and exciting, there was one incident that happened to me when we went to Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park, California, that really changed everything. Now, this isn't the scariest thing per se, but it is quite creepy, and it makes you wonder, what's wrong with certain people? So let's begin. Arriving to the lines. I can recall kids playing and screaming, running around in circles, as themed music played over the loudspeakers. Adults were looking at their phones, and they were talking amongst each other, as my cousin and I got behind a couple of teenagers, and we started to wait our turn to enter the park. About five minutes of waiting and the line slowly moving forward, I couldn't help but notice this man, all alone, with no other family or kids. To give you a rough description of him, he was about 5 foot 11, 190 pounds, wearing a long white t-shirt with loose blue jeans. He was bald, with a goatee and had tattoos on his neck, as well as full-on tattoo sleeves on his arms. Something that stood out was the Ace of Spades tattoo that he had under his left eye. Anyways, I tried to ignore him as I got the vibe he was one of those typical creeps, as my cousin also notices him too, but just as we're a few groups behind the ticket taker, the man asks me if I had a boyfriend, and if I was interested in hanging out with him. He continues by saying he could get me to the front of every line in the park as he knows the owner of the park and was good friends with him too. Highly doubtful. Now, I thought people around me were going to say something, but nobody did, which was pretty odd. Therefore, I ignored him, and he kind of seemed to just awkwardly back off, as I made the assumption he was embarrassed by my response. So anyways, we're soon inside Knott's Berry Farm, and for the first few hours, my cousin and I are having a blast. I'd already put the weird creeper in the back of my head, and so far things are great, apart from the large crowd. At noon, we started to get pretty hungry. So we opted to grab ourselves a couple of hamburgers and french fries. This is the point I had the urge to use the restroom. So I told my cousin I would be right back as she takes a seat and waits for our order. I had a difficult time finding the restroom, but luckily a janitor was able to point me to the nearest one, which apparently I had totally missed. So I do my thing and then I step outside, ready to head back to enjoy a delicious meal. But guess who I bumped into? Remember the man from earlier who claimed to know the owner of Knott's Berry Farm? Yep, here he is, presumably going to use the restroom. However, spotting me, it seems he's changed his mind. Hey, I thought I'd never see you again. Did you have some time to think over what I said? I can still recall him saying to me, with this really creepy smile, as I pushed past him and continued. He now begins to follow me, and it's at this moment... I'm getting pretty creeped out. Why would he be following me? And what had I done to deserve this? Not sure. But one thing I wanted to do was grab the attention of someone as I'm making the walk back to the food area. Perhaps a security guard. Well, it seemed as if Lady Luck was on my side. Because the next sequence of events were just so strange and weird. After continuously catcalling me, Someone actually overhears one of his comments and comes up to the man and asks him if there was an issue. This guy was huge, 
He was easily over six foot five. I would estimate 240 to 250 pounds. Now, so that I don't confuse you all, I'm going to refer to this new guy as Kevin. Why exactly Kevin, you might be asking? It's because my favorite wrestler's name is Kevin Owens. But whatever, let me continue. This is none of your business. My daughter is just being very difficult. When I heard the creep say that sentence, I got the sudden chills. Was that what he thought? I proceeded to tell Kevin, who was there with his two daughters, that I had no idea who he was, and that he had been following me for the past few minutes. It seemed Kevin also didn't believe him, as he overheard some of the catcalling, knew for a fact you didn't say those certain phrases to your so-called daughter. After about ten seconds, Kevin basically calling out the creeper, and it seems he's learned his lesson, as he's going to turn around and leave. Kevin then starts walking over to me, but I remember gasping as I tell Kevin to turn around. The creeper suddenly charges toward our direction, and I can remember as Kevin turns around and practically knocks the dude's teeth out of his mouth. Yeah, a direct hit to the jaw. The creeper pretty much stumbles back for a few seconds and just looks over to us with his look of anger and defeat. A security guard did happen to see this very moment, and he walked over to me and tried to see what was going on as a crowd of onlookers starts to form. Before the security guard could question Mr. Creeper, however, he just runs away. Luckily, after some explaining, the security guard gets on his radio, and he promises us they'll try to find this creep and kick him out of the park when they can find him. Not sure if they ever did catch him, as neither myself nor my cousin saw that creep again. As for Kevin, I thanked him profusely, and he just told me that he was glad to have been there at the right place in the right time, as he was also very protective of his two young daughters, and would have done the same thing. So anyways, that was the time myself and my cousin went to Knott's Berry Farm, and I met the so-called friend of the owner of the park. This is something that happened to me four years ago, one evening when my husband had gone to work. For reference, this is coming from the perspective of a 33-year-old female who at the time of this occurrence was six months pregnant. Anyways, I just finished a long day of cleaning the house and was enjoying some television, sitting on the couch with my pet cat laying peacefully on my lap. After about an hour of sitting... I got in the mood for an iced coffee from Starbucks, and I almost considered having somebody deliver it to me. But then I thought, the Starbucks is only a three-minute drive away. Why would I want to spend all that money just to deliver my drink? I was able to convince my lazy bum to get up from the couch, and I made the quick trip to grab my dose of caffeine. Who knew that grabbing my coffee was going to be the cause of such a bizarre, and might I add creepy encounter. I reach the Starbucks, pulling up to a parking space and then make the short walk over to the building. Apart from a couple of patrons that were sitting inside and one person ordering, everything is relatively quiet. I enter the Starbucks and I'm immediately welcomed by one of the baristas who I was friends with as I take out my phone so I could get my Starbucks app ready. I made my order moments later. And I'm standing next to the bar area, looking at my phone, as I await my drink. Instead of being interrupted by the barista, somebody puts their hands on my shoulder, and instantaneously, I get this very strong smell of what I can best describe as a mix of rotten eggs and weeks old worn socks. I step forward a few inches, then look behind me in confusion, and I can see it's this weird man with one of the creepiest smiles I'd ever seen. Hey, could you please keep your hands to yourself? I barked back at him, trying to get the attention of everyone in the building. Luckily, that seems to work, and he kind of just backs off and says he just wanted to say how beautiful I looked and how I reminded him of his daughter. Sort of a strange compliment, I thought, but I tried not to make a big deal, as thankfully my drink was ready and I could finally leave. I grabbed it and made the assumption this was going to be just a one-time deal. But unfortunately, 
This man follows me out of the Starbucks. And for the first few seconds, I thought maybe he too was leaving. But when he called out to me, I knew he was looking for more. I ignored his continuous catcalling and I continued to walk over to my vehicle, grabbing my car keys with my free hand out of my purse so I could disengage the lock. I just want to talk to you. Could you just give me a moment of your time? He says, sounding a lot more desperate and anxious. I told him to get lost, and he suddenly flips out on me. He starts screaming and shouting, and even kicked at my car saying that he just wanted to be friends, and I was being the jerk for ignoring him. Yeah, as if him catcalling me and kicking at my door wasn't the definition of being a jerk. I just decided to back up and I pulled away, and I began making my way towards the exit of this parking area. That should have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. When I looked in my rearview mirror, waiting for an opportunity to get onto the street, I see a brown ram power wagon just inches away from my back bumper. Yup, your assumption was correct. It's the creep, and he's trying to get me to pull over. I booked it as soon as I get the chance to, but he's continuing to follow me, and I'm starting to panic. Looking back, I know leading some random person that's following you back home is a terrible idea, but in that moment I hadn't thought of it. Maybe this was a blessing, and you'll see why in a moment. I pulled up into my neighborhood, my husband just picking up the phone, as I can see my house, and I'm struggling to get words out to him. He tells me to relax and asks me where I was, since he had come home to pick something up, but he couldn't find me. I did notice he was parked in the driveway, by the way. I manage to get out that I'm being followed by a strange man, and I ask him to step out of the house in order to assist me with getting rid of this creep, who at this moment, I've come to the conclusion that he's completely insane. So, I pulled up into my driveway as the man in the Ram Power Wagon stops and parks just a short length behind me. I decided to wait in my vehicle, keeping the doors locked, as this dude makes his way over to my window with what's a utility knife in his grasp. I can still remember my hands shaking and my palms sweating while he starts banging on the window, but the sense of relief falls over me a few seconds after when I can see my husband storm out the front door with his shotgun. In seconds, the man does a complete 180 and books it back to his vehicle. Since this was in the evening, it was sort of difficult to get a picture of him with my own phone, but I did manage to snapshot his license plate, and I also got a picture of him when he was pulling away from the driveway. As you'd expect, I was completely shaken to the core, and I couldn't stop from shedding tears as my husband holds me in his arms and tells me everything was going to be fine. For some good news, the cops did manage to catch up with him, taking our police statement and evidence seriously. And since that evening, I've never seen or heard from that creep again, apart from his insurance, paying for the damages he caused in my vehicle. Whether he was on something or he was genuinely trying to stalk me, I don't really know, and I never really looked into it more to figure it out since I wanted to put the incident behind me. My husband and I have since moved to another state, and we live a quiet and peaceful life with our two young daughters. Just to quickly preface my story, this is coming from a female, and it's from the year 2011. At that time, I had just broken up with my boyfriend of two years, and I was at a low point in my life. I didn't really want to see any of my friends, and I just opted to go back to my dorm as soon as my classes were over. My roommate, Ellie, noticed the change in my behavior, and she was the one who encouraged me to go out more. In a way, it was a blessing, but it was also a curse. You see, a couple of days before Halloween at a party, Ellie introduced me to a friend of hers, who we're going to call Josh. He was a handsome fellow, tall and medium built, blue eyes, brown hair, a light stubble for facial hair, and a really nice smile. Ellie had mentioned that he himself had gotten out of a toxic relationship, and he was looking to make some friends. And at first, that's how things were. 
We started off just talking about common interests, as we both loved art and running. Every morning we would meet up at 6 a.m., and we'd go for a two-mile run around the campus before going about our daily lives. During our breaks, we would meet up and grab food, and then we would sit in the school arboretum and draw while listening to music. How sad, because for all the negative things that would happen, I really missed those peaceful afternoons at the arboretum, as you could hear the birds chirping and feel the wind press against your cheeks. Eventually, he asked me out, and I of course excitedly said yes, as my confidence had now more or less returned. Fast forward to about two weeks after we officially started dating. I'm on Instagram scrolling through my feed and commenting on friends' posts, when suddenly I notice a notification for Facebook. I exit Instagram and hop on over to Facebook, and it's a message from this random girl I've never met before. Essentially, the message said that they were my boyfriend's girlfriend, and that I wasn't allowed to be with them, because she was his. Naturally, all the alarm bells are going off in my head, and I'm wondering what kind of sick joke this could possibly be. In that moment, something clicked in my head, and I recall Josh telling me about an ex-girlfriend that he had. And this was something that I confronted him about, and he then proceeded to break down and explain himself. Apparently, the reason he had broken up with that girl was because of how toxic the relationship was. I guess she was the very paranoid and clingy type. She even once threw a knife in his general direction, missing him by just a few inches, as it got stuck in the wall next to him. The crazy part was there was no explanation for it. She just went mad. I know looking back that this was pretty bad news, and I should have really thought about things more. But I really loved Josh, and he loved me. He assured me and swore left and right that he would never do anything to hurt me. And that girl who messaged me was no longer a part of his life. Well, what do I do, you might ask. I proceed to block her, and that seems to work as there's no more further contact. But things aren't over just yet. They would come to a head a month later. It was a movie night, and Josh's parents are away for the weekend. I'd gone over to his place to not only accompany him, but to get away from the busy and annoying life of the dorms. There we were, at around 10pm, sitting on the couch, watching comedy movies, and having ourselves laughs, when all of a sudden, we hear what sounds like scratching at a door. Josh turns the volume down, and for the first few seconds, we don't hear anything. We assume it was from the movie, but as Josh is about to turn up the volume, we hear scratching again. This alarmed Josh and I, as he gets up and heads towards the source of the noise to investigate, as I follow closely behind him. The noise leads us towards the kitchen back door, and at first we can see this hooded figure attempting to open the door. We thought it was a home burglar, but we would be wrong when Josh turns on the back porch light. To our surprise, it was a girl, and not just any girl. It's Josh's ex, and she's got a knife. I let out a scream as through the window, Josh asks her what she was doing and why she was armed with a blade. She proceeds to cry and laugh maniacally, and then starts banging on the door, saying to let her in so that she could, from my best recollection, cut me up into bit-sized pieces. I nearly had a panic attack as my body went cold seeing her, as she then started to kick at the door with all of her might. I immediately phone for the police, as Josh is doing all he can to get her to calm down. However... During the phone call, his ex says that she was going to go after Josh too, and make him pay for all the heartbreak he had caused her. It's just so scary looking back and thinking how she pretty much looked as if she was possessed. And I'm not trying to sound mean, but that's the best way I could describe it. In any case, the cops arrived just as she walked off the property, and we can hear the officers tell her to drop the knife. I proceed to run over to the front living room alongside Josh, and we see through the window as she tosses the blade into the bush, and then they go and handcuff her. 
The cops ended up questioning Josh and I extensively, since the ex kept saying we were in the wrong. But when all was said and done, we were cleared. Unfortunately, for myself and Josh, we had a falling out a couple of weeks after that incident, after it resolved itself. It started as a break, but it ultimately ended on a mutual level. I just couldn't take it after all that drama I was put through, which really affected my mind. Since then, I've moved on, bought a home, and I've married a wonderful man who I love very much. I occasionally check up on Josh a couple of times a year, and he's doing great. He himself also got married, and he has two beautiful boys. I actually messaged him before writing this, and I asked if it was okay to share, and he was cool about it. He even helped me with remembering some of the important details. Hey there. Former security guard here to share a story I've been wanting to tell for a while. It's not super long, but I figured you'd still like to hear it anyways, as I myself enjoy listening to scary and creepy stories. This was back during the late 1990s when I used to work for the Brea Mall in Southern California. Now, the city of Brea is a relatively peaceful city. Very rich, and I'm talking more about the people. The city has a lot of money and people own some really expensive and nice homes. Even today, Brea is very profitable. Not that it's really important to the story, just that you get a certain class of individuals that are very calm and respectful. Not really a place you might see junkies or troublemakers. That is unless, of course, on the rare occasions when you're like me and you're working. So there I was. I'm in the food court having myself a pizza when I get a call over the radio about someone in one of the restrooms inside Sears, claiming to get the strong smell of skunk. The employee went on to further say the guest who reported the smell said someone appeared to be smoking inside one of the stalls, which to me already explained what I was going to have to deal with. Someone who thought it was a great idea to come into the mall restroom and get turned up and blazed, if you know what I mean. So since I was almost done with my pizza anyways, I was just sitting there being lazy. I get up and make my way over to the restroom in question. There were some customers who were just standing outside of it and telling me some dude appeared to be talking to himself and yelling at anyone who got in there. So leave it to me. I enter the restroom and ask if anybody was in there, not that it wasn't an obvious question. The man in the stall curses at me as the smell that was mentioned from before enters my nostrils. I tell the man that if he wasn't going to cooperate and leave, I would have to call the cops. That, surprisingly, worked, as the door opens right away, as a man in a trench coat stands there with red eyes. As I believe he's about to head out, he grabs his small backpack and throws it at me. Then, he charges at me like some sort of enraged lion. Well, with adrenaline pumping, I pretty much bear-hugged him and then slammed him to the ground like a football player as a couple of men came to assist me. As we try to get him to calm down, a pocket knife falls out of the man's trench coat. That pretty much chilled me to the bone. I mean, think about it. He could have very easily have grabbed it and then have come after me or one of the customers. Anyways, I'll save you the rest of the drama. But we end up calling the Brea Police Department, who arrived to arrest the man, who was in possession of narcotics, alongside the knife and even a glass pipe too. Apart from customers who were trying to shoplift and having to break up fights between angry dads, nothing else as crazy as that incident happened to me again during my employment there, at that mall. Back from 1997 to 2001, I worked at a Sears, located inside her town shopping mall, first as a cashier, then eventually into an assistant manager. Now, I know a lot of people will give retail a tough time, and yes, it did have its moments, but if there was one positive, it did help me with gaining experience for my future self. Currently, I'm a manager at Costco, and I love what I do. Now, what I wanted to discuss with you today was something really scary that happened to me while I was on the job at Sears. It was in the beginning years, 
I don't remember the co-worker's exact name, so we're just going to call him something generic like John. But he was a real troublemaker. A lot of customers would mention he was really rude with them, and any time they'd ask for his assistance, he would tell them to come and ask me instead. Heck, even my fellow co-workers couldn't get along with him. As for myself, I was very neutral, and I pretty much tried my best to just talk to him on the minimum. One afternoon, I remember John getting into a huge fight with the boss. After some back and forth, my boss ended up firing him on the spot, which really upset John. There was just something about the expression on his face I can still remember to this day that read, I'm coming back for you if it's the last thing I do. At least for the next week or two, things were calm at that Sears, and the negative energy that John brought with him every day finally let myself and my fellow workers be at peace. So the evening in question. It was my birthday, and unfortunately I had to work that night. However, the really nice thing was all of my co-workers pitched in to buy a really nice cake and even a pizza from Domino's as well. Therefore, during our breaks we would be in the back eating, talking, and just having a good time listening to the radio. So it was during my final 15 minute break, and I wanted to grab one last slice of pizza. As I head toward the back room, someone pushed past me, which unfortunately caused me to bump into a nearby wall, making me hit my head. They only flashed in my vision for roughly a second, but it was enough to tell this wasn't a co-worker. We do occasionally have customers walk into the back room thinking it's a restroom, Thus I follow after them thinking this was the case, not that I was already caught off guard by their rude behavior. Almost immediately, as I turn the corner of the break room, I hear my boss arguing with someone. Could it be that another co-worker of mine was being problematic? No, because the person who had bumped past me wasn't some random customer or co-worker. It was John, the fired employee. What happens in the next 20 to 30 seconds is John basically having an explicit shouting match with my boss as I'm standing there trying to get John to calm down. He pushes me, which then causes me to fall into a table where our food is placed on. That angered me so much that it was the final straw. No longer was I going to stand on the sidelines and say nothing. So as one of my co-workers went to get security, John does something that would prove how serious his angry rage truly was. He grabs one of the metal forks that had fallen to the ground and proceeds to go after my boss, who at this point is trying to get away from him. Now, I forgot to mention, but my boss was this petite, 5 foot, 100 pound, 40 something year old female who would have stood absolutely no chance against my fork wielding nemesis. That's why I get up and try to take the fork out of John's hand, but he ends up scratching me in the face with it. It's scary because he was just a few inches from poking my eyeball out, which would have been really bad. Anyways, I proceed to wrestle with him as another co-worker comes over to help get the fork out of John's hand, a face still stinging and burning from the attack. Security finally arrived and helps detain John as police arrived within minutes to not only handcuff John, but arrest him too. He was arrested on assault charges, and I ended up pressing charges against him, because, well, why wouldn't I? Huh, <laughs> talk about a birthday. To wrap things up, I continued to work there as mentioned until the fall of 2001, eventually opting to get into UPS. Then in 2010, after nine years, I quit and started working at Costco, where I met my wife, and where I am today. Things have been relatively peaceful in the past few months. We did get some crazy customers back in March of 2020 when the lockdowns happened. And I've got some more scary stories that took place here at my Costco if you want to hear them. But I think that's enough for today. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing this. And let me know if any of you out there have had an experience with a scary co-worker. It would be great to hear it in one of the Creepy Fox's future videos. This is probably not as scary as some of the other stories you've heard the Creepy Fox cover, but I thought it was worth submitting anyways, as I'm a huge fan, 
and I enjoy listening on a nightly basis. At the time of this occurrence, I was working a part-time job at my local mall at one of those stands that sells chocolates and candies alongside cards and letters. Now even though my little store, if you want to refer to it as such, was located in front of a very busy Sears, we rarely got customers. Those we did get were usually teenagers around my age, or children looking to get their parents to get them some candies and sweets. On the very rare occasions, we would get the weird customers. However, as there are a couple of security guards who make their rounds, the only bad thing that happened to me was just a customer yelling over not having Reese's cups. Yeah, no kidding. But okay, let's jump to a couple of days before Valentine's Day. We had just gotten a shipment of flowers that we had on display for sale, alongside all the other things I mentioned before. During this shift I was working in the evening, flowers were going like hotcakes, with people coming up to my store in groves. I recall while ringing up this really nice woman, who was there with her daughter, I noticed a man, probably 50-ish year old, who could have easily have been my dad, who was just staring over at me from one of the nearby benches. He gave me this really creepy half-smile look and wave, and I just ignored him, opting to finish what I was currently doing. Once the woman and the little daughter left, I took a look at my phone to see if perhaps I had gotten a text message from a classmate who was supposed to send me their part of our group project, but nothing. I sighed at this lazy classmate, and as I focused my attention back up to the cash register, the man, from just moments ago, is walking over to my candy stand. Didn't you notice me waving at you? The man said, in a somewhat disgruntled manner. As I felt his eyes begin to stare quite literally into my soul. No, sorry. I was busy ringing up a customer. Was there something I could help you with? He proceeds to call me something that I can't even repeat here. It's that bad. And I basically have to tell him he's got to leave or I was going to notify the mall security. He downright refuses and downplays his crude statement, saying it was a joke and that I should be the one to apologize, as I was being rude for ignoring him. I took a step back, and gave him an expression of, Really, dude? Before I began thinking of what I was going to say next. But then, another customer walked over, and the man went silent, turning around, and opting to walk in the other direction. Now, as I've told this story to many friends, they know just how weirded out I was by the entire thing but I truly thought it was going to be just a one-off thing, and maybe that man was just looking to blow off some steam. Sucks I had to be the one on the receiving end, but what can you do? Well, fast forward a few days after Valentine's Day, and I'm coming back from my two days off. My coworker Natalie told me that the other day while she was working, this man came over to the store and was asking for the girl with the glasses and the short brunette hair saying he was her uncle and needed to get her phone number. Natalie found the whole thing bizarre, and explained that she had just started working there the day before, and didn't know who he was talking about. Now, I knew that there was no way it could have been my uncle, as he lives about three hours from my city. Not only that, but if he wanted to contact me, I had him on Facebook. Also, he could have asked my dad for my number if it was really that important. Well, I got a bit suspicious. I told my co-worker Natalie that we should just ignore it, and that would be the end of it. Fast forward to about three hours into my next shift, and a familiar face walks over to my candy shop. It's the same 50-year-old man from the other day. He kind of just stood there looking at some of the chocolates and decorations, as customers were waiting in line for me to ring them up, with their bags of treats waiting. Now what happens next was completely unexpected and creepy to say the least. All of a sudden, the man pulls out a little box and there's a ring and in front of all these customers proposes to me. He proceeds to explain that I was his princess and that he was my prince charming 
here to take me to his magic kingdom, far from the so-called kings that controlled my existence. I think he might have been referring to my manager. Honestly, I wish I was joking here, but I'm afraid I'm being serious. Anyways, fellow customers are just looking at him with this look of disbelief, and as I begin to address his ridiculous proposal, he reaches for my arm and grasps it tightly. He pulls me forward, which causes me to bump into the front counter. That hurt like a mother, I'll tell ya. It's at this moment a customer is telling him to knock it off, and suddenly he loses it and tries to punch him. What a mistake that was. The customer, who I like to refer to as the champ, punches the creep square on in the temple, who then lets go of my arm and falls back into a display of birthday cards. Are you okay? The kind gentleman asks me, as who I find out is his wife, is waving down a security guard. Yeah, I'm fine. Just my arm hurts a little from this tight grasp, but I should be okay. No kidding. But Prince Charming, ugh, I hate saying that, but whatever, gets up and then tries jumping over the front counter, saying directly to me, let's get out of here, honey. The champ, now there's a name I can get behind, literally grabs this dude by the waist and does a sort of German suplex, like you see Brock Lesnar do against his opponents in the ring. Finally, two security guards arrive and along with the champ, are able to take him away for questioning. I was, as you'd expect, full of emotions. I was angry, confused, but most importantly, scared. Why? Why was it me out of all people? I honestly wish I could sit here and give you an explanation, but I really can't. Anyways, this is getting kind of long, isn't it? Sorry. I just wanted to conclude with I only worked there for a few weeks after that incident, and I quit as I couldn't feel comfortable working at that candy stand. I never did see that creep again, so I'm not really sure whatever happened to him other than I hope that suplex he received taught him a major lesson. This occurred in 2011 in my small town in North Carolina. I remember this happening on this specific day because I ended up getting rejected by the girl I had a crush on ever since that semester had begun a few weeks prior. It was quite a blow, but my friends told me I was pretty brave for getting the courage to tell her my feelings. Which, yeah, I guess that was true. And I eventually moved on and got a girlfriend, who I'm still with right now. But that afternoon was quite a downer. All I wanted to do was get some donuts from one of my local donut shops, at home, turn on Netflix, and just watch a bunch of movies with my dog. And so that's how it all began. Once my final class let out at 3pm, I hopped on my bicycle and rode 20 minutes to the donut shop, eagerly awaiting to get my hands on some heavenly sweet goodness that would look to alleviate my stress. With my mouth watering and salivating, I soon arrived at said donut shop, and I see that apart from one car that's in the drive through it looks rather empty. Awesome, I thought to myself. It would be a quick in and out, and I can head home and enjoy my afternoon. Megan, the owner of the donut shop, welcomed me with open arms as the front doorbell chimed and a refreshing blast of air conditioning air hit my face. Like that satisfying feeling of when you jump into a swimming pool on a hot summer's day. I did see inside the display of donuts your typical flavors, like chocolate and jelly filled. Perhaps however what really got to me were the Valentine's inspired donuts, which instantly soured my mood. Megan noticed this and asked why I looked so gloomy, and I quickly mentioned the girl I asked out, who had rejected me earlier. Megan felt bad and she ended up offering to give me a donut for free, and I actually went ahead and accepted her offer. Now, as I was talking with Megan and picking out my other donuts, a man in an oversized khaki-colored trench coat walked in through the back door. I only noticed him for a brief second as he passed by my peripheral vision and then got behind me and just stood there. Hey, 
You got any smokes on you? I heard a gruntling deep voice say behind me. As this garbage like smell enters my nostrils, from what I would find out would be this guy's really bad B.O. No, sorry, I don't. I reply with a half smile on my face as he starts to look in all directions and then begins mumbling to himself. Megan looked at me and thought it was strange, but she ended up continuing my order, finally getting my sweets into a pink box. I then went ahead and handed her over my ten dollars, and I was on my way. Or so I thought. While I'm preparing to take my seat on my bicycle, I happened to look into the donut shop through the outside window, and I saw that the man who was behind me moments ago was reaching for the cash register, trying to take out money. Now I don't know what came over me, but I dropped my donuts, and I rushed inside, not even realizing the fight I was about to get myself into. Well, I tell the guy to knock it off and leave, but he suddenly pushes me back, telling me to mind my own business, or I was going to be sorry. Megan, meanwhile, is struggling with the man and trying to fend him off, as a baker in the back is calling for police. I ended up getting up, and I start to approach him again, and as I'm just a few inches from socking him right in the nose, I saw him put his hand into his trench coat pocket. I connected with his cheek, and as he stumbles back for a few seconds, I hear what sounds like an object hitting the ground. I took a look, and I saw a switchblade, which was lying about halfway beneath the front counter and the tiles where I currently stood. My heart immediately began racing, thinking that had I not knocked some sense into him quite literally, he would have held on to that switchblade, and then possibly have come after me with it. With his revelation, I kicked the switchblade further underneath the front counter, as it ended up sliding over to Megan. She then grabbed it, and suddenly this man books it out of the way he came from, not even saying a word, or making some sort of struggle to fight back. Now, thank goodness that cops weren't even that far, because when they searched the area, they were able to locate him quite easily in a nearby alleyway. Though, what would you expect when he's got this khaki-colored trench coat that easily stands out? Anyways, I did give my statement, and after a bit of talk with the police, I ended up heading back home, though that afternoon's mood had changed completely. By the way, in case you're wondering, it turned out the guy who I stopped that afternoon was a local homeless man who was well known by the police department for being quite a troublemaker. Unfortunately, that donut shop closed a couple of years ago. However, I still will occasionally talk to the owner, as my mom and dad are really good friends with her, and her husband. This has been a long time coming and I've been meaning to share one of my creepy stories for quite a while. Apologies for not getting back to you, but when you work at a grocery store full-time as a manager, you almost never get a break to just sit down and write, or even read for that matter. So here I am. This was something that happened to me late 1990s, when I went on a road trip as a means to move on from an ex-girlfriend of mine, who had essentially dumped me, where I would later learn she had been seeing my then best friend. It was rough, I'll admit, and as a young guy in his 20s with nothing but the world ahead of him in college, my studies took a turn for the worst. I can still recall the semester I found out the heartbreaking news. I barely passed my classes, and if it wasn't for some extra credit opportunities, I may have had to retake some courses. But that's besides the point. It's just some random information I wanted to share as a setup that leads to the road trip I just mentioned. Once that semester ended, my plan was to drive from my home in Southern California and head toward Las Vegas for a week, where I had an uncle that still lives there to this day. Then once I'd gotten my fill of the strip and casinos, I'd head toward Arizona and visit the Grand Canyon. Finally, after spending a couple of days doing some backpacking and some photographing, I looped back around and headed back home. Sounded like quite the plan, 
and it was pretty peaceful at first. Now, I'm not really going to focus on my time with my uncle, since that was relatively uneventful. I'd say the only cool thing that happened was we went on a helicopter tour around Vegas, which I still have a photo of somewhere. Anyways, when I was approaching the Grand Canyon, it was around 7 in the evening, and I had been looking for a place to stay for the night. I ended up trying a couple of hotels, but when I pulled up and walked in to talk to the receptionist, they told me they were booked. A bit disappointed twice, I decided I'd go grab some food, and then I'd try again at another hotel. Luckily, third time was the charm, and I managed to get a hotel that was quite a bit of a ways from the Grand Canyon itself, but at least it was way cheaper than the others I tried. The hotel would be the location of one of my more creepier memories. It all started after I finished checking in and I'd placed my baggage in my room. I recall taking a long hot shower, then laying down for about 30 minutes surfing through the same 15 or so channels they had on offer. At about, I'd say, 10 p.m., I had the urge to go for a smoke break, but I realized I left my cigarettes in the car. Now, I don't smoke anymore, thank goodness. But back then, I had to at least go for one before I went to bed. It was my relaxation, if you will. So, I went ahead and walked out of the hotel, still full of energy, and I make my way over to my parked vehicle in this comfortable, 50-degree dark night. Now, this parking lot, from my best recollection, was not only very dark, the lights were almost non-existent apart from the starry sky and a few street lamps scattered across said parking lot, but it was also very quiet. You could hear the sounds of owls and wind whipping through the trees, and even my footsteps echoed on the pavement. Well, I was standing next to my car, enjoying the peaceful evening, and then a set of footsteps could be heard, shuffling, through the parking lot. At first, I didn't really mind them, since I made the assumption somebody was just out for a walk. But after roughly 15 seconds of seeing no one, again, it was hard to see anyways because of the lack of visibility, I began to grow quite paranoid. It's a very difficult emotion to describe in words. A lot of times, when I hear the stories you narrate here on the Creepy Fox, people will mention similar feelings, myself included. I can agree in saying that you can't really quite express it on paper. You have to experience it in person. So anyways, I'm still standing there having my smoke, like a complete moron. And just as the footsteps I was hearing grow louder and closer, a figure walks out from behind a couple of stationary vehicles. They were tall, scrawny, and it wasn't until they were just a few feet from where I stood I got a better look at them. The man appeared disheveled. Long, greasy, grayish-brown hair fell down his shoulders. A stench like something I would best describe as rotten eggs entered my nostrils, and his clothing was tattered and ripped, as if he had just gotten out of a fight with a mountain lion. This is the moment I began to grow nervous as I finished my cigarette and then I proceeded to lock my car, ready to head back to the hotel. All the while, this man is just standing there and staring at me. Nice evening we're having, right? The man said nothing. He just continued to stand there and stare at me as if I was speaking a completely different language. And all the while, his hands haven't left his coat pockets. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your night. Before I could finish my words, the man walks even closer, blocking my exit, and practically within breathing distance, tells me to hand over my keys to the car. I took a step back, and I tell him that wasn't going to happen, and what he does next forever sends shivers down my spine. In one quick motion, he takes out a knife and tries to slash at my stomach. I don't recall if it was cat-like reflexes or just my sense of fear, but I ended up jumping back at literally the last second, as he still managed to connect with my sweater, cutting off a bit of the fabric. I booked it back to the hotel so fast that I don't think I've ever run as fast as that ever again. All the while I looked back, 
only to see the man begin to run in the complete opposite direction and disappearing into the nearby tree line. By the time I made it into the hotel lobby, I practically gave a heart attack to one of the janitors, who I remember was mopping the floor, and I tell him about the man in the parking lot who has a knife, and I even show him the slash in my sweater. Needless to say, the hotel goes on lockdown and the police were called as we pretty much kept a lookout for the man with the knife. He never did come back, and when police arrived, I remember they did a full-on search of the area with park rangers, including the parking lot, forest, etc., until the all-clear was given. Now, I don't know if he was ever captured, but I do know for a fact I was seriously this close to being mugged and having my car stolen. Although, considering he tried to attack me with a knife, he already went into the mugging, knowing full well he was going to take someone's vehicle, even if it meant by force. So, friends, I can conclude by saying that being in any sort of fight-or-flight situation is no fun. Please, and I mean please, do your best to never fight back, especially if the person you're facing is armed. It's better not to be a hero, and there's no shame in running away from the danger. Literally, no one will give you a tough time for it. And really, they shouldn't, to be honest. And just like my title states, driving in Mexico at night can be quite the scary experience, especially depending on what state you're in. Now, obviously, you have the contenders like Sinaloa, Guerrero, and Michoacán, but as this happened in the year 2004 when I was 15, violence, although still prominent, was very rarely heard of during that time period. It's not like today in 2021 where if you live in Mexico, you're always hearing in the news about how there was a balacera, as it's called over there, almost every other night. Anyways, I'm not going to really get into that. If you're interested in true crime, you can look it up yourself. Instead, I want to focus your attention to an incident that occurred when I was on vacation visiting some family in the state of Jalisco. They live in Guadalajara, a generally safe city that is the epicenter of the state when it comes to business and trade. You can walk down a street and be surrounded by any businesses you might think of. Shoes, clothes, food, you name it. There was an abundance of it. So, I remember it was roughly a week into my stay. My uncle and aunt surprised myself and my two younger cousins by saying we were going to go to Puerto Vallarta for the weekend, which is a resort town a few hours away from Guadalajara. As a side note, if you've seen some of the older videos the Creepy Fox has put out, you'll see that he has included some footage of Puerto Vallarta in the past, so go check them out so you get a sense of where I was going to go. Anyways, continuing here. I remember how excited I was, as the last time I had gone there prior to my 2004 visit was in the year 1998, when I was only 9 years old. And I remember that year specifically, because I ended up getting a cold while on vacation. Well, when we left for Puerto Vallarta, we didn't leave the house until roughly 4 p.m., as my uncle was taking care of some work at his clothing store earlier that day. It wasn't really a bother for me or my cousins, as we loved being able to sit in the back of the truck and let the breeze of the cold night flow through our hair, since during the daytime, it's practically an oven. Yes, if you didn't know, in Mexico, it is okay to sit in the back of trucks. Everybody does it. You just gotta make sure you're not jumping up and down and standing up, or you're going to go flying off if you're not holding on. Not that I think I've ever heard of it happen. Nonetheless, I remember we stopped at a Pemex gas station to use the restroom, as well as grab some chips and soda from the convenience store. One thing my cousins and I noticed as we waited for my uncle to return with our food was this somewhat fancy Mercedes Benz with its windows tinted out that was parked at the very back of the gas station. There were a couple of men standing outside of it wearing sunglasses, from what I remember just talking and appearing to be drinking. I recall I made a comment about how nice the car was, but other than that, we continued on with our jokes and games. Now, when my uncle came back out with the snacks, 
He told us we needed to eat the food inside the car, as he didn't want any of the food flying out of the truck, and then us complaining and crying. It made sense, so we hopped into the back seat, which to this day I'm so thankful that we did. We now drive back onto the main road, and are once again resuming our trip to Puerto Vallarta. This time, however, I recall I noticed that Mercedes that was parked in the back of the gas station was now following our truck. Now, considering it's not uncommon to encounter the same vehicle for miles on end, as this is a one single stretch of road, they don't really raise alarms. However, after approximately 20 minutes of driving, we began to see the vehicle get closer to our truck, and I'm talking, literally bumping into the back of our vehicle. Of course, my uncle is getting pretty angry, and he's telling my aunt he wants to stop the car, so that he could see what their problem was. The only thing is my aunt is telling him not to, instead advising my uncle that we should move to the side of the road, so that they could pass us and be on their way. To no one's surprise, the Mercedes is still keeping up, and it's now things are getting a lot more scarier. It doesn't help that we haven't seen any other vehicles within the past 30 or so minutes, which means we're on our own, with no cell phone by the way, as my uncle and aunt didn't have one yet. Now, little did we know that the people on the Mercedes appear to be in cahoots with another vehicle, because literally from out of nowhere, another vehicle, this time a minivan, pulls up from the side of the road and proceeds to block the highway in front of us. I can't tell you how scary that was, and if it wasn't for my uncle's quick reaction, sliding over to the other lane to avoid the minivan, things could have ended really badly. Anyways, we once again looked back, everybody on high alert, sweating, hearts racing at a million miles an hour, and my cousins crying. And this is when we saw as the vehicle soon disappeared behind a bend. That was only temporary, however, because moments later, they are soon catching up, and we are seriously starting to run out of options. Why? Why was it that they were so obsessed with chasing us down, and what had we had done to deserve this sort of stalking? With answers still up in the air, we are relieved when not too long after, we see a pair of red and blue lights flash on, who then join us on the chase. This is the moment in my retelling we use this opportunity to stop and get help, which appeared to have worked, because the two other vehicles pretty much pressed on, never to be seen again. That essentially confirmed our suspicions that they were possibly trying to rob us, if not worse. After a brief talk with the police officer, or should I say Mexico's version of highway patrol, he ends up calling for backup, and the officer accompanies us as we wait for his partners to arrive. They did, and we were escorted into the nearest city soon after. Let's just say our vacation at Puerto Vallarta was cancelled, and we returned back to Guadalajara. Now to this day, we don't know who those people were, but it is our belief they might have been part of the cartel or some organized criminal group. Believe it or not, there are stories of people being followed on the roads in Mexico only for them to get stopped, cornered, then robbed of their vehicles by armed men, and then left at the side of the road to fend for themselves. Look it up if you don't believe me. Anyways, friends, I guess this saying can be used in any part of the world. If you do plan on traveling, be very careful of the areas you're in. Do some research ahead of time. You can lower your chances of encountering quite a frightening event by traveling during the daytime and in groups as opposed to just one vehicle. So with that, stay safe friends and always be on the lookout for danger. Before I begin, yeah, I'll admit, there is a lot of setup that leads to my actual scary encounter. I wrote it out this way because I really want you all to experience this from the start, all the way up until the end. So please stick with me. I promise it's worth it. Also, for reference, this is from the perspective of a 27-year-old female. Anyways, this occurred two years ago, when I was commuting from my work all the way back home. To kind of give you some context, 
Every morning I'll take the train in Fullerton, California to work, in Riverside, California. After I'm off, I take two different buses, starting in Riverside, to Anaheim, which drops me off right in front of Disneyland, and then I take the last bus, back to Fullerton. I actually preferred it this way because I didn't want to put so many miles on my car, and I wouldn't have to worry about getting service done more often than I needed to. And besides, I've never had any problems with public transportation. I've actually met some really great people traveling this way, and one friend is someone I still play video games, even today. However, there was one evening I made a misjudgment that saw me going through quite the scary encounter. So, again, it started like any other afternoon. I clocked off at work, and I immediately head over to downtown Riverside, so I could wait for my first of two buses. I recall it being a slightly chilly overcast day, with some wind here and there, as I sat down on a bench, sipping on some gas station coffee that I had picked up only minutes prior. Eventually, the bus arrives, Along with seven or eight bus goers, we get on, and we start to make the trip to Anaheim. Now, funny enough, I was listening to some scary stories on my phone, and I got so lost in the storytelling that I hadn't realized just how quickly we had gotten to our first destination, as I saw the Disneyland sign in my peripheral vision. Nice. This was perfect, because I couldn't wait to get home and step into the shower and just relax after a long day of dealing with people and the daily stress of work. As I get off the bus, I notice that not even 20 seconds later, there is another bus approaching from behind me. Now, I normally will take the 43 bus north, which takes me toward Fullerton, an average 10-minute ride. So I didn't really second-guess this bus as it arrives, but I did not notice there was no signage on the front, which distinguishes this bus from the other. Now, what do I mean? Well, there are actually two bus numbers. One heads towards Fullerton, the 43. The other heads towards San Bernardino, the 200, the complete opposite way. Now, I never made the mistake of taking the wrong bus home. Thus, myself all confident, not considering seeing any clarification on which bus I was taking. And by the way, still listening to my scary stories on my phone. Step into the bus and I first notice there is a different bus driver. My couple of years taking the 43 bus towards Fullerton, I'd gotten to know each of the bus drivers. This lady, however, was completely brand new. I remember giving her a friendly hello and smile like I normally do with each of the bus drivers, but she had the resting you-know-what face that pretty much read, leave me alone and don't talk to me. A bit disappointed, I swiped my bus pass and I head toward the back, my usual spot, next to a window, and I continue to focus on listening to the scary stories as a couple of more bus riders join me. The bus now begins to take off, and I smile knowing I'd be home soon relaxing in my shower. Well, as I looked at the passengers, I noticed I didn't recognize any of them. The nice Disney cast members I would usually catch and have a chat with were nowhere to be seen, and even the cool homeless guy who had this really sweet acoustic guitar was missing in action. Maybe perhaps I just missed them, and they had taken the bus before this one. Strange, considering 95% of the time I'd see at least one of them. Now, if you haven't already come to the conclusion, I'll explain it to you in simple terms. I was on the wrong bus, and sadly, it wasn't until we got on the freeway, I realized my mistake. Immediately, I head toward the bus driver and ask her where in the heck we were going, as I needed to go to Fullerton. She scoffed at my remark, and with her sassy attitude, she mentioned we were going toward San Bernardino. Well, that couldn't be right, I tell her. I reassured her this had to be the 43 bus, but she tells me it wasn't. It was the 200 bus, heading towards San Bernardino. Well, great. The no signage on the front messed me up, and now I was stuck not knowing if there'd be a bus that could take me back to Anaheim, then back to Fullerton. Oh, what a mess. By the way, did I forget to mention this bus driver's attitude? 
Yeah, she didn't even care that I was on the wrong bus. She just told me to go back to my seats and I can figure it out when I get to the bus station. Yeah, you heard right. So that I can figure it out. Not we, as in her and I. Man, I really hope they got somebody new. Anyways, I head toward my same spot, and an elderly gentleman who had listened to my remarks stops me along the way and says there is a bus that returns to Fullerton and that I'm not the first one to make this mistake. Well, I'm able to confirm his statement when I look at the bus schedule, and I see that indeed, about 30 minutes after I arrive at the bus station, I can catch a bus back to Anaheim. Alrighty. Annoying. But hey, at least I knew I wouldn't have to rack up quite a bill using Uber or a Lyft. So eventually, we arrive at the bus station, and the first thing I noticed, apart from it now being dark, was just how run down the place was. There was a lot of trash scattered across the street, homeless people and junkies arguing with one another, and just this overall sense of dread that told me, girl, you need to leave right now. And thus, the waiting game begins, as I stand next to the bus stop and eagerly await my rescue, so to speak. I unfortunately made the completely foolish mistake of continuing to have my earphones in my ears, hoping I could wash away any sort of sounds of trouble and be in my own personal safe haven. That is until, of course, this homeless man walks up to me and, without even saying a word, rips the earphones out of my ears. What's your problem? I bark at him, taking a step back in confusion. Do you have some money on you I can borrow? He asks me, with the smell of alcohol leaking out of his breath. I tell him no, and so I begin to walk away, and all of a sudden I hear him yell at me. Hey, I was talking to you, he remarks, beginning to chase me down with a look of anger. I'm starting to get a bit freaked out as nobody is saying anything, and it appears as if this is a normal occurrence around these parts. Now, being chased by some crazy dude is already creepy enough, but when he takes out a used syringe and then begins to chase you... That's when I lost my cool. I remember running over to a convenience store and bumping into a security guard who was grabbing some donuts and talking with a cashier. As I began explaining my situation, at a breath and pointing toward the street I had arrived from, the homeless man sort of just stopped in his tracks and looked at me from a streetlight with this really crazy and deranged look. He was then joined by another homeless guy, and they just stared at me for a few seconds, before walking off in the complete opposite direction. Now, to say I was freaked out it would definitely be an understatement. Just imagine it being nighttime, being somewhere you've never been before, and being chased by a crazy man with a needle. I don't care how tough or brave you are, you're gonna react. At any rate... The security guard was nice enough to not only escort me back to the bus station, but he waited alongside me until the bus arrived, and I made it back to Anaheim, then to Fullerton, without any further complications. Since that incident, I continued to take the bus. There was a point things did get impacted because of the lockdowns, but it settled, at least for the time being. Now, even though I haven't made the same mistake of taking the wrong bus, I always ask the bus driver anyways if I'm going the right direction, even if I know the answer is going to be yes. By the way, to the security guard at the San Bernardino bus station, if my story sounds familiar to you, and you're somehow a fan of the creepy fox and listen to his stories, it would be great to hear from you, even though I realize the chances of him hearing this message are quite low. I just hope all is well, and thank you once again for helping out this lost girl get home. Back in the early 2000s, I was hopping in between different jobs, trying to earn money to help get me through college. After leaving IHOP, where I worked as a waiter, I left because of bad management, by the way. A friend of my dad's told me there was an opening at a little liquor store, as a cashier at the bus station in my city. It really didn't sound like something I would want to do, but with the job and position more or less handed over to me, I figured what's the worst that could possibly happen. 
apparently, a lot. I only worked there for three months in the summer before I quit because of a very scary incident that, to this day, I'll sometimes think about and wonder back what might have happened had things not gone the way they did. Now, combining this young, 23-year-old kid in a liquor store, you're bound to get plenty of weirdos. However, I grew up in a household with two older brothers who are in the military. Thus, I thought I could handle myself in any situation. I even took self-defense courses and always carried pepper spray on my person. I like to think those details along with my do-not-mess-with-me attitude and facial expressions were the reason why most people were intimidated by me, even though I'm a really nice guy. That wasn't exactly the case this time. Anyways, the night in question that would make me consider my employment at that liquor store was on a weekday evening when it's just me and a couple of customers. These two customers were regulars. They'd always come to check up on me, as well as get their hot dogs and sodas. Really cool dudes. I actually kind of miss them. I considered them like my uncles. So it's approximately 10 p.m., and the two customers I mentioned are outside the liquor store, sitting at a bench that overlooks the bus station. As for myself, I'm sitting there organizing the front counter, which consisted of a display of Cheetos chips, the lottery tickets, and various assortments of candies and chocolates. Out of nowhere, I heard the front doorbell chime, and I looked up to see a man with a hoodie covering his face enter the store, and he immediately walked behind one of the aisles. I normally greeted customers who entered, but this guy just ignored me completely. Whatever I thought, you can't be friendly to everyone. So I continued to organize the front counter. When I happened to look at the security cameras, just a couple of minutes later, I saw that man who entered the store had taken out a box of Coors Light from the back refrigerators, and with a knife, was opening the box. He then proceeded to indulge in said drinks, like this was his house. My immediate thought was my boss was going to fire me if he found out a customer was drinking beer without paying, especially on the premise. However, my main concern was this guy has a knife, and you know, alcohol and knives don't exactly mix well. So what do I do? Well, I proceed to call the police, which luckily the police station was only a few blocks away. Now as I'm talking on the phone, the man walked over to the front counter and he starts asking me, in a paranoid tone, who I was talking to and why I was acting so nervously. All I remember saying was police were on the way and that he was in a lot of trouble. Now, at this point, I got a better look at the man. And I saw that his facial expression went to one of anger, and in one quick motion, he began making his way over the front counter with the knife. I dropped the phone, and I immediately booked it outside, screaming and trying to get someone's attention. Well, remember the two regulars? Yeah, they kept me safe as we run over to the bus station to try and get to safety. Thankfully, police were able to get there in record time as the man booked it out of the little liquor store, now with a grocery bag with money inside, police demand him to get to the ground. He does, as the man drops to the floor and surrenders almost instantly, throwing the knife to the side. Police are then able to make a quick arrest, and this was when we walked over, and I basically explained to the police I was the one who called about the disturbance with a man and a knife. Essentially, my boss arrived soon after, and I ended up giving my statement, going into detail on what the man had done. That was pretty much it. I continued to work there for about another month, until I quit to focus entirely on my studies. Fast forward all these years later, and I wonder what might have happened had I not been so quick to react and run away from the danger. I'm not sure, but... That's my story of when I used to work at the bus station as a cashier at a liquor store. This happened on a Friday evening, a week ago. To set the scene, I live in Buffalo, New York, and if anyone knows anything about here, it's that we get a lot of snow. So I would shovel for my four neighbors, 
whenever it was going to snow overnight. I'd stay up to go for a late night shoveling session. This would limit my load for the mornings and actually help me get some extra cash while I'm at it. I know it sounds kind of messed up, but hey, it works. As I put on my Nike ski mask to protect me from the cold, I walked out into the street to cross the road over to my neighbor's home to start shoveling. The snow was coming down hard, and the wind didn't help me whatsoever in what was sure to be another typical night of shoveling. It was super quiet, calming. There was just something so peaceful about being alone in a blizzard at night. I remember I looked down the road to check for cars, and about a football field's distance away, a man, in all black, was walking. Now, thanks to the lake effect of the snow, I couldn't exactly tell if he was walking toward me or away. Now, nothing happened while I was shoveling, except seeing the occasional neighbor in the window on their computer with a nice cup of hot cocoa by a warm fire. While I was walking back to place the shovel in the garage, I had to do this because of the increasing crime in the neighborhood. I could have sworn I saw something, or better yet, someone running in my backyard toward my neighbor's backyard. We don't have a fence connecting my home to my neighbor's because of the woods in my backyard, so I had to assume it was some deer or raccoon because nobody would be out at this hour and at this temperature. I remember I made it a point to walk into my home fast. You see, my family members would be gone for the evening because of my sister's dance tournament. So I used this as a perfect opportunity to pick up a pizza and listen to the Creepy Fox and Mr. Nightmare. It was 11.30pm now, and I was by my fireplace with a cup of hot cocoa, reading Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. And that's when I hear a tapping at the window. What was worse is when I realized... The tapping was consistent. I texted my buddy across the street to come over to chill and check it out, and he did. My friend Jason came over and actually looked pretty concerned. Jason said he saw footprints at the side of my house, leading into the backyard. He followed these footsteps, and it led him to the back of some tree, and that's what it led up to. I remember I invited him to stay the evening, but of course Jason didn't want to. When Jason left at around 1.45 a.m., I heard a knock. Then, two knocks. Then pounding at my back door. I freaked out, and I hid in my closet with three blankets over my head as I phoned the police. About five minutes later, I heard from the front door, Police! I rushed from my cozy hiding spot to greet the officers, as I noticed something bizarre. There were no cop cars in the near area. I remember I went back to my hiding spot, and that's when I heard a huge bang on the front door. When the police actually showed up, they escorted me and searched the area, but absolutely nothing. The footprints, however, ended in the woods, and the only thing besides the footprints was an axe that was chopped into my door, as well as a poor deceased rat at my front door step. Now, since then, I've been on edge for a while. We recently installed a home security system, and I've made it a point to never shovel in the evening, ever again. To preface this story, it's coming to you from a 24-year-old female. This was in February of 2018, when I had gone to visit my aunt and uncle, who live all the way up in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm from Georgia originally, by the way, so just to get there was quite the adventure. Now, one of the reasons, or should I say, the main reason I went to visit my family was because I was trying to get over a bad breakup from an ex that I was dating a couple of years ago. Without getting into too much detail, basically he was very controlling and pretty toxic, but that's since behind me. In total, I stayed with my aunt and uncle for three weeks. It had been snowing quite a lot during my stay, which I absolutely adored. If we weren't out traveling somewhere, we went to places like Seward, Alieska, and Fairbanks. I would find myself just sitting next to the chimney with a nice cup of hot cocoa, looking out the window, and watching the snowfall. There's just something very calming and soothing about that. Well, on one early morning, 
My uncle woke me up and asked if I wanted to join him on his trip to Palmer, where he was going to meet up with a friend and deliver some firewood. I agreed, seeing as I wanted to get out of the house anyways, and we proceeded to spend the roughly four hours of sunlight driving, visiting his friend, and doing a little sightseeing. Now, something I have yet to bring up that I was also doing along with my stay in Alaska was filming and taking lots of pictures. You see, I've always been an avid photographer. At least I like to refer to myself as such. So when I got the opportunity, I would do filming. It's actually similar to some of the things the Creepy Fox has posted in his previous videos. Just taking film of the mountains, landscapes, woods, snow, etc. Anyways, about an hour before sunset, we decided to stop along the way at a McDonald's to grab some chicken nuggets and french fries for the almost hour drive back home. Once back on the road, my uncle mentioned that there was this really beautiful frozen lake coming up in the next few miles that offered a really amazing view in the afternoons as the sun hit the horizon in the snow. He mentioned, since I was doing some filming anyways, this make a great portfolio shot. I took him up on the offer, seeing as I hadn't really taken video or photographs of a frozen lake, and thus we take an exit that sees us stopping at a little rest area. I call it a rest area, but basically it's just this little restroom building at the side of the road, with a trail you walk on for about three miles, where you reach the frozen lake. So my uncle and I step out of his truck, a light snow falling and breeze passing through my blonde hair, and we begin the walk toward the lake, snow crunching with each and every step. The frozen lake was absolutely gorgeous. It seemed to go on for miles and miles, as the golden orange and yellow lights of the sunset mixed in with the cool winter's colors that were the mountains and the snow. I quickly took out my camera, and I began to take various pictures and videos, making sure to pay perfect attention to the sunset itself. After roughly seven to eight minutes of filming and photography in the almost 20 degree weather, my uncle tells me he needed to use the restroom real quick. I remember telling him I just wanted to take a few more pictures, selfies to be exact, and then he tells me he'd wait for me. I took a look at his face and I could see that he really needed to use the restroom really badly. That's why I proceed to counter by saying, I'm a big girl, and he doesn't have to worry about leaving me out here on my own in the snow, since he's just a short walk away anyways, and there's still sunlight left. After a 30 second speech of how I'm responsible and essentially this grown adult, my uncle, reluctantly, turns to walk away and tells me to be quick. Oh, trust me, things went quick all right, but for all the wrong reasons. After about two or three minutes since he had left me, I was just standing there trying to share some video to my Snapchat friends so they can watch what I was doing. Spoiler alert, the videos didn't go through, as the signal was spotty at best. Suddenly, I heard footsteps and snow crunching, and what sounds like whispers coming from the nearby tree line. Now... As far as I knew, and that I was aware of, it's just my uncle and I out here, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So lo and behold, to my surprise, walked out two men, bundled up in their heavy coats, snow pants, and boots. One was holding a hatchet, and both had this really creepy look across their face. A look I like to best describe as a sort of, ooh la la, look what we found, kind of facial expression. I remember instantly getting this really bad feeling in my stomach, and without acknowledging the two, I began to turn back and briskly walk back in the other direction, toward my uncle and the truck. At this moment, I assumed the two men were probably out doing some ice fishing or something, maybe even chopping firewood, because again they had the hatchet, but I then started to notice they are beginning to walk in the same direction as me and they're gaining speed. Get her, was the last thing I remember hearing, before suddenly these two behemoths are racing toward me like a couple of hungry bears going after their meal. Me not really being used to running in the snow, I'm screaming like no tomorrow, awkwardly pouncing through the snow, 
and just praying to the sky above, my uncle would hear me. Well, thank the heavens above my calls for help were heard, because my uncle was already on the way back toward me. This time, I see he had taken out his pistol he keeps concealed out of his holster, and he has it firmly grasped in his left hand. Suddenly, I hear the footsteps behind me come to a halt as I reach my uncle, who has this look of anger I had never seen before in my life. My uncle proceeds to yell at the two men, who basically tucked their tails between their legs and booked it back in the opposite direction without saying another word. Me, panicked, scared, on the verge of crying and throwing up, is quickly escorted back to the truck, where my uncle and I finally leave and make a full escape. Now, I was kind of expecting my uncle to yell at me and tell me how I should have listened to what he said, but he actually felt bad and apologized, to which I told him it was no fault of his own. After all, you don't expect to just be doing some filming in the middle of a snowfall, only for these two complete randoms to come chasing you. To this day, I can only imagine what those men had in mind, and what they might have tried doing had they reached me. Truth is, they had bad intentions, and if it weren't for my uncle coming to the rescue and scaring them off, I might not have been able to share my story. My best word of advice to you all, though it should be obvious, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have the option of being alone, don't. Always have somebody by your side, because the last thing you want is to be in a situation such as mine. Edit. I just wanted to add this. It's not part of my story, but I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Creepy Fox, for doing what you do. Your videos are a huge help to me, and they really help with coping with life's many struggles. Stay safe, my friend, and blessings to you, your family, and even your animation team you work with, the voice actresses, and the animator. Please give them my warm regards as my little sister and I are real huge fans of your Aria Rose project. My sister really loves Aria. Meanwhile, I really love Tiana. Anyways, looking forward to what's to come. This happened in 2016, and it began when my older brother James came to visit me for his spring break. For some context, he had moved out just a year prior in 2015 to go to college leaving just myself, my mom, my dad, and our two golden retrievers. At the time, he was 19, and I was 15, just four years younger. Anyways, seeing him was a huge relief as we were very close growing up, and I'd missed being able to play video games together, or just go out into the backyard and go walking in the woods. That's what we did after I'd finished school, since when he came to visit, I was still attending classes. My spring break didn't start until the following week. Anyways, when it came to his last couple of days before he would go back to his apartment, he asked me if I wanted to go visit him for my spring break. It could be an opportunity to get out of the house and experience what it's like to be away from the family, he had mentioned. My mom and dad both agreed it would be a pretty nice opportunity, and so with their blessing I packed up some clothing for the week and we hit the road two days later on a Sunday. So far, I have just given you a bit of context to set up the scene, me visiting my brother for spring break. While things started off with a simple five-hour road trip north, consisting of laughs, jokes, and junk food to accompany our adventure, little did I know the completely petrifying experience I was going to have just a few nights later. A memory that even as I share this with the creepy fox, will occasionally pop up in my head and make me go, wow, imagine if things went in the complete opposite direction. Fast forward to night number three at my brother's apartment. He had returned from his classes at approximately 2 p.m. and told me he'd have to meet up with some of his classmates later that evening as they were getting together to do a study group. I was a bit disappointed considering he told me that morning he would be free but I did understand as his break was already over. My brother James promised he'd be back home no later than 8pm and said he'd pass by the local pizzeria to pick up a large pepperoni pizza. 
sounded like a plan. I told him I'd take the opportunity to take a nap, and then maybe play some Overwatch on his Xbox. So after my brother takes a shower and does some cleaning up, he leaves me all by myself at approximately 4pm. I remembered I then played some Xbox for about an hour, and then I closed my eyes to get some rest at about 5.30pm. Now, I have yet to mention the apartment complex my brother lives in, but I guess it would sort of be a good time to mention it now, wouldn't it? As this is a decent-sized series of apartments next to each other, there are many other living spaces amongst us. This means, let's say someone were to, I don't know, break in, you'd think a neighbor would notice, right? Well, at about 7.30pm, the sun already setting for the day, I was awoken to what sounds like a knock at the front door. Now, I've always been quite shy. Even today, when it comes to answering the door, I don't like to do it. So I went ahead and closed my eyes and ignored it, hoping whoever was knocking would leave. After 15 seconds of a consistent knocking, things fall silent, and I make the assumption whoever was there had already left. Give it about five minutes, and what I hear sends a shiver down my spine. I hear the clear and audible sound of the back door that's in the kitchen slide open. Now, there is a little backyard, if you want to call it that. It just consists of concrete and a small patch of dirt with some chairs and a table that's surrounded by a small wooden fence. So lo and behold, I'm a bit confused as I hadn't heard my brother come in. In fact, I saw on my phone that he had texted me about 15 minutes earlier saying he was just leaving campus and was about to head over to the pizzeria to grab our food. I knew that there was no way my brother could be home in such a short amount of time. There just couldn't be, right? Unless he could teleport. So then how did the back door open? It had to be done by force. In that moment, I made the quick and perhaps smart decision to instinctively get off the couch, then jump behind it and hide in the darkness. Yes, I guess I could have taken the opportunity to run out the front door, but I didn't. Anyways, as I'm in the living room, which if you look just ahead gives you a complete view of the walkway that leads into the kitchen, I see a huge towering figure of a man, just standing there wearing a large hoodie with the hood covering his face. I remember trying so hard not to make a single sound, as I remained perfectly still, watching from the crack of the couch as he begins to head over to the cabinet that's in front of me. And then, he starts to look through the drawers. He took out a couple of video games, and then he put them into his large pockets, before proceeding to head to the second story. This was my opportunity to make my escape, so when he passes the bend of the staircase, I quickly and quietly get up from my hiding spot, step towards the front door, open it, and I run across the way towards where I saw a neighbor who was on his phone. Hey, are you okay? Do you know that man in the hoodie? He said, as I tried to catch my breath. No, I don't. I was taking a nap, and I heard him enter. Okay, because I'm on the phone with the police right now, and they're sending a couple of officers as we speak. Remember how I mentioned that there are so many possible witnesses? Yup. Thank goodness one of the neighbors had noticed this hooded man's suspicious activity, and he had proceeded to call the cops for me. I didn't do it as I was too scared the man would have heard me, and I would have revealed my hiding spot. Nonetheless, I explained I was the brother of James, since he did mention he had never seen me before, and give it approximately five minutes later. The cops are just pulling up into the parking lot. It's right behind my brother James's apartment, from the safety of the neighbor's front door, we watched the hooded man jump out of the backyard, only to be met with two police officers. After a small chase, officers quickly caught up to him and placed him under arrest. By this moment, my brother James is just arriving and runs over to me making sure I was safe and sound. In short summary, it turned out he was just some random burglar who thought for whatever reason it was a smart idea to break into someone's apartment. And speaking of breaking in, the back door was left unlocked, which was how he managed to break in. It's just scary to think my brother's apartment was the one he chose to break into, 
I thought perhaps maybe he was just trying his luck with random households, and it seemed he had got lucky here. Now, the detail that scares me the most was the man was carrying a switchblade in his pocket, alongside the couple of video games he stole, and even some money he managed to find. Thankfully, everything was returned, and after some consulting by my brother and the police, we were able to enjoy our pizza just a short while later. I'll admit, I did try my best not to let this scary incident ruin the rest of my vacation, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit I was paranoid to stay at the apartment all alone. I opted to join my brother at his community college the following days and just stayed in the library playing video games on my laptop and taking advantage of the free internet. Even today, now as an almost 20 year old myself, knocks at the front door still give me the chills. I know that chances are I'll never encounter that man again, but part of me still can't help but envision him whenever I'm home alone. Back in 2019, my family and I went to Mexico on vacation for spring break. We stayed at the Hard Rock Hotel, located in Nuevo Vallarta, Nayarit. Alongside my cousins, we spent most of my vacation either swimming in the pool or hanging out in the VIP lounge where they offered drinks and snacks. One evening, out of our week's stay, both myself and my cousin Maria wanted to go for a walk outside of the resort and across the street where there's a Starbucks and a little shopping mall. That evening, my mom, my dad, my aunt and uncle, and my other younger cousins were going to be attending a show for the kids. Maria and I weren't really interested and told everybody we would be back for dinner, which we had reserved at one of the restaurants inside the hotel at 8 p.m. They said it was fine, so we shower and get changed after swimming in the pool all that afternoon, and we head over to the Starbucks to sit and get a couple of coffees. By the way, we are both 24-year-olds, so it's not like we needed adult supervision or anything. Anyways... We arrived at the Starbucks and we both ordered caramel frappuccinos and spent the next 30 to 40 minutes just sitting by the window, catching up on life, listening to the sounds of the music playing over the speaker system, and enjoying the peace and quiet of vacation. It's now approximately 6.30 p.m. As we're talking, Maria and I couldn't help but notice something quite odd, which at first we wrote off as just a coincidence. There were these two men in these really nice suits wearing sunglasses who were kind of just sitting outside by the street at one of the benches, staring at us, for whatever reason. At first it wasn't too obvious, but after turning our attention to them every couple of minutes, it became evident that they had an interest in Maria and I. We, of course, didn't. So when we get up to leave, and then begin making our way to the shopping mall I mentioned, what do you know? The men begin to follow, albeit from a distance. For the next 20 or so minutes, we walked around the shopping mall, just looking at clothes and outfits. But every once in a while, we would see those two shady men staring in our direction from a distance, and talking amongst themselves. It finally got to the point where we started to get a bit paranoid, so we decided to head back to the hotel earlier than expected. 7 p.m., and we're making our way onto the sidewalk, and we're passing the Starbucks from earlier. We start thinking, perhaps those guys had finally given up and left, or maybe it was just one big misunderstanding. After all, we no longer saw them, but then something happened, which, to this day, we will never forget, even as adults. I turned around for whatever reason, and saw the two men who had been following my cousin and I, one of them was on his phone talking to someone. I told Maria to start walking faster, but as we're waiting at a red light of all things, a Mercedes-Benz pulls up to Maria and I. No less than ten seconds later, one of the doors opens, and a man, wearing a bandana over his face, with sunglasses on, I kid you not, tries to grab a hold of Maria's arm. I told her to move, and luckily she is able to, just as the man stumbles forward and falls onto the concrete. We booked it into the neighboring convenience store, and the guy who tries to grab my friend instantly jumps back into the Mercedes 
and they end up taking off. Quickly, the cashier who had seen the action ushers us into the back room and proceeds to call the police. Maria and I were out of breath for the next ten or so minutes, and we couldn't stop crying, thinking that they might have tried taking one of us away. Unfortunately, the police weren't of much help, other than taking our statements, including the cashiers and a couple of customers. The officers ended up dropping us back off at the hotel, and they had a talk with my family. You bet that the rest of that vacation, we opted to stay inside the hotel, until it was time to head back to the airport, which is pretty much a perfect descriptor of the rest of the vacation. I still believe to this day that those guys were eyeballing us for a reason, and they had been in cahoots with the people in the Mercedes-Benz. Who knows what they had planned, although you do hear stories of people being taken in Mexico, which is scary to think about that that could have possibly been either me or Maria. My best advice, because to be honest, Nuevo Vallarta is relatively safe, so you wouldn't expect this sort of activity. Never leave the resort you're staying at, or better yet, make sure you're in a large group if you do plan on leaving. It's really sad to think, but there are some really evil people in this world, and this pretty much confirmed that you can never be too careful. I mean, look at my experience. Though it wasn't in broad daylight, it did happen in a pretty well-traveled area, with a decent amount of people and witnesses. Anyways, anyone who's going to travel to another country, please be safe and learn from my lesson. By the way, as far as I know, they never caught those men, so they remain at large. When I turned 16 years old, my parents finally allowed me to stay home by myself Gone were the days of having to get a babysitter to keep an eye on me as I sat in my room playing video games or watching movies in the living room. Although I did miss the lady who would look after me, she was an elderly woman who lived down the street who made delicious food. I did enjoy my newfound freedom, if you will, which allowed me to do whatever I wanted. Although doing whatever I wanted mainly consisted of more or less the same. It was just having the comfort of being alone that really added to the overall feeling of becoming a young adult. Alongside the ability to be at home by myself during the summertime, I also enjoyed the freedom of having friends stay over and spend the night to keep me company. I think that's what I enjoyed the most, the sleepovers. Anyways, it was summer 2006, and this one weekend my parents had joined my aunt and uncle as they went to Las Vegas for a family friend's wedding. I was going to go, trust me. Who wouldn't enjoy spending time at the swimming pool or at the all-you-can-eat buffet? But as I'd be the only teenager, I didn't really feel it was worth going since my options for entertainment were limited. Therefore, I recall inviting my best friend, who in this story will refer to as Jim, to spend the night over at my place so we could do your typical teenage boy stuff. Stay up all night, eat junk food, play video games, watch scary movies, the usual. So that's what we did, and the first day was fairly routine. The next afternoon, I can recall that Jim and I went to the local arcade and hung out with some friends, opting to grab dinner at the food court, consisting of delicious, yet very greasy and cheesy pepperoni pizza. Once our bellies were filled with pizza goodness, Jim and I excused ourselves, and we went back home to spend the next couple of hours watching movies. At around, I'd say it was 8.45 p.m., there was a knock at the front door. That knock then proceeded into multiple knocks. It got annoying, and I was really hoping whoever was out there maybe had the wrong house. After about 20 seconds of knocking and ringing, things settled and Jim and I start relaxing, thinking whoever had shown up had given up and left. Fast forward about three minutes later, and we can hear my backyard wooden fence open very slowly. It has this distinct audible noise it makes even if you open it slowly, so it did cause some concern. Bear in mind, we did have a fan blowing pretty hard in my room, which masked most of the surrounding noise, 
and since I didn't have air conditioning, the windows were wide open in my house, allowing a decent breeze to flow through as it was a hot day. Also, to note, my room had no windows, which was another reason why everything was open, as it becomes an oven in the summer. Anyways, the distinct sound of the fence opening caused Jim and I to get up, so we could head over to the window that overlooks said fence. This was a short walk down my hallway, with a restroom and my parents' room along the way, then it turned to the left at the end of the hallway, which led us into the living room. When we reached the window and peeked ever so cautiously through the curtains, we didn't see anything apart from the fence being slightly opened. However, we could hear footsteps. This in turn had us going over to the back room that overlooks the backyard, but we don't make it that far, because as we approach, we hear something that sends a shiver down our spine, the back door handle being jingled and moved. Jim and I froze, thinking that there was no way it could have been my parents, and no way it could have been a neighbor. So we immediately grabbed a couple of kitchen knives from the sink, and then booked it over to my room so we could call 911. We also proceeded to put a wooden chair under the door handle of my room, something we had seen in movies. And as we whispered to the operator that we're hearing noises in my backyard, hiding in the closet with their knives. We hear footsteps coming from the kitchen. We're now starting to breathe more frantically, and we're shaking and sweating, as the operator is trying to calm us down, and saying officers were being dispatched to our location. Those five minutes of waiting were some of the most anxious and nerve-wracking moments of our lives. It didn't help that the footsteps approached my room, and the door handle began to shake violently. We heard what sounded like kicking, and we could see the wooden chair begin to move. We were so scared, because the kicking was so loud and aggressive that we truly believed the door was about to break open. But thankfully, that door was made of sturdy wood, as it stayed in place. The noises slash footsteps then proceeded to then make their way into the adjacent bedroom, my parents' room, and we can hear drawers being opened and things being tossed around. Finally, we get our relief when we hear from the thin walls of my house, the intruder, or as we found out, intruders say, the cops are here, as their footsteps then frantically make their way down the hallway. No less than 20 seconds later, we heard the cops yell, get down on the ground, and drop the knife. We didn't actually witness what happened, just the noise. And it wasn't until the operator told us it was safe to step out that we finally got to see the aftermath. The house was a mess. As I mentioned, things were tossed around. Chairs, furniture was moved, drawers were opened, and there were even muddy footprints all over the carpet. Now, I feel like my submission has gone on long enough, so I'm just going to skip all over the police detail stuff and get to what happened and the revelation. The guys who broke in were amateurs in their late 20s, who already apparently had a criminal history of theft and robbery. They were also armed that evening with knives, using said knives to open one of the screens on the windows in the kitchen. Remember how I said the windows were open? That's how they got in, as the back door was locked, which we heard them attempting to open before they broke in. Admittedly, we were very freaked out that evening, and we decided to spend the night over at Jim's house. But that wasn't before I called my parents to inform them of the situation. They were very worried, but I assured them things were taken care of now that I was at Jim's house. Luckily, the money and jewelry that was stolen was returned back to my family. And as for the home burglars, we never did see or hear from them again, thus ending what was perhaps one of the most nightmare-filled moments of my life. Hi Creepy Fox, I've been listening to your channel for well over a year now. Now I'd like to go ahead and share one of my stories that I think would fit perfectly in a video that is themed on sleepover stories. This was some time ago, dating all the way back to December 2006. Let me set the scene for you all. My friend and I, his name in the story will be Kevin, were very excited as we were looking forward to getting our hands on the Nintendo Wii. I'm almost certain anyone who remembers that holiday season remembers the rush of the new consoles. 
The Wii was perhaps one of the most difficult and sought after consoles for a customer to get their hands on. Day one saw records, and without a reservation, which were already difficult to get, you were pretty much left out of the fun. Luckily, Kevin's oldest cousin, Jeremy, had mentioned that the target he was working at would be getting a select amount of Nintendo Wii consoles, roughly 25 of them, on a Saturday morning. This was in early December, by the way, a few weeks after the Wii had released. Now, I won't be talking about the morning of when we got our consoles and spent that entire winter break playing the Wii, but instead I want to focus on the night beforehand, when it happened. So let's take you back. It's 7pm, Friday night before we get our Wii, and Kevin's mom had just finished making us dinner. We were now in the living room watching a movie, and we're just relaxing and talking about all things Nintendo, surely getting on Kevin's parents' nerves with our nerdy talk. They ended up going to bed at roughly 8pm, as Kevin's dad would have to wake up early the next morning for work, and his mom would wake up early to make us breakfast, then drive us over to Target to pick up the consoles. With one last reminder to sleep early, the once lively house grew quiet and dark, as Kevin and I turned the TV off and head over to his room to continue our conversations. For the next hour or two, sitting on our lazy boys, we played the GameCube until our eyes grew heavy and we head off to bed. Fast forward to a little past midnight, and I woke up with the strong urge to use the restroom. I got out of the guest bed and walked by the bedroom window, only for something in my peripheral vision to catch my attention. A light would shine brightly in the backyard. I peeked through the glass window, and with the help of the backyard porch light just illuminating enough of the backyard, I could just make out a man dressed in all black and matching ski mask, holding a flashlight, and also what looked to be like a hunting knife. I remember going crazy, and immediately heading over to Kevin's bed to wake him up. Kevin! Kevin, wake up! Someone's in your backyard! It took a few attempts. Kevin was always a heavy sleeper, and after some shaking back and forth, he stumbles out of dreamland, almost punching me in the process. Kevin! Look! I tell him, as we once again peek through the window. Not that we get the chance to do so, because the man outside was now at Kevin's window, trying to pry it open with the knife. Kevin and I screamed like little kids and book it over to his parents' room, waking up his parents instantly, unlike Kevin who sleeps like a brick. Kevin's dad tells us to stay in the room and lock the door, as he then takes his shotgun he keeps under the bed and heads outside to confront the masked man. All we heard was Kevin's dad yelling and screaming various obscenities, which was immediately followed by footsteps which ran away. Cops were called, but the man was never caught, at least not that evening. A few weeks later, some blocks away, a man was caught by the police trying to break into a home. The details given of the man matched the same of the man I saw that night. Ski mask, matching black pants, shoes, and sweater, also had a knife and flashlight. So that was the night I had a sleepover at my friend Kevin's house, and we came face to face with an armed home intruder. Edit. Though that night was quite frightening, we still woke up early and got our hands on our Nintendo Wii's, which put the scary incident, and its memories, to rest. Out of all the countless hours I've spent listening to the Creepy Fox and other narrators, I've almost never heard of this kind of experience happening. After it took place, I looked up some articles and even some news reports, and I was shocked at how common of an occurrence this is. This is the kind of scary experience that leaves you at a loss of words and thinking, wow, what did I just listen to? I think the lack of help you can get to resolve this kind of thing is what makes it worse. You don't really get the justice that's deserved for people who apparently dedicate themselves to doing these sorts of actions. But now that I've spent a few moments hyping up my story, and hopefully got in your attention, I want to rewind to 2020, May. The lockdowns are in full effect, and everyone and their mothers are hunkered down in their homes, ordering takeout and going out for groceries and medications. 
I myself, being happily married and a father of two wonderful children, was blessed enough to be able to work from home in my office, pretty much spending every day, Monday through Friday, working on documents, as well as scheduling appointments for clientele. I remember this being a Thursday afternoon, because that was the day my wife was working 12 hours. She's a registered nurse, and works at the local hospital, which, as you probably already guessed, was jam-packed with sick patients. As for my kids, they were over at my sister-in-law's house, and I'm just there munching on some checks mix and reading an email I received from one of my co-workers. Out of nowhere, I see the screen turn on on my phone, and I notice a really long number. Now, I normally almost never answer calls from numbers I don't recognize, but for whatever reason, I decided to answer anyways, most likely because I was pretty bored and just wanted to get my mind off of work. As soon as I answered, palms and fingers still oily and salty from my crunchy snacks, I'm hit with a very aggressive voice. This is going to pretty much be what I remember the conversation going like, so the wording isn't going to be exact, but you get the idea. I answered, and I said, Hello? Who is this? Hey, do you speak Spanish? The voice on the other line said, I answered no, telling him I barely remembered the words I was taught in my high school Spanish class, and all of a sudden he starts yelling in Spanish. This is then followed by a lot of bad words and vulgarities in English, then a line that made my heart drop. We have your wife. Do as we say, and I promise nothing will happen to her. Then I heard a scream of a woman in the background, crying for help, and yelling out things that were hard to understand. The man begins to speak again and tells me that if I weren't to wire him $10,000 in the next hour, I would never see my wife again. You can already imagine the scene. I'm shaking, heart racing like a race car in NASCAR, and I'm desperately trying to catch my breath. Please, no. Put her back on the line. Don't you dare do anything to my Marianne. Obviously not her real name, just making one up for this story. Regardless, I made the foolish mistake of saying her name, and I begged and cried like I'd never done in my life, as he begins explaining the process of wiring money to him, and all the while I'm starting to think. My wife was at the hospital. How in the world could she have been taken by someone who's now demanding money? I don't know, but I foolishly grab my car keys, and I begin walking outside into the driveway. In that moment, my sister-in-law is pulling up with my kids, and she sees the look of panic and fear in my eyes. The man on the line asks me who I was talking to, and then goes further to say that if it was the police, that was it. In that moment, I put my phone on silent and tell my sister-in-law someone had taken my wife. She looks at me, and then she explains she had just spoken to her no less than three minutes ago to advise her the kiddos were being taken back to me. Still on mute, I tell my sister-in-law who was calling, and that's when she says, She's fine. Hang up, and let's call the police. The man on the line is asking me why I wasn't speaking, and then begins to curse at me yet again. This is when I finally hung up, and immediately I phoned for my wife, who answered me on the second ring. Thank the Lord, she was okay, and she was on her break about to go back to work. I pretty much gave her a Spark Notes version on what had just occurred, and she manages to relax my nerves my kids staring at me like I was some sort of madman. Long story short, I did phone the police, and I explained what had happened word per word, and the police officer I spoke to tells me that it was an extortion scam. She explained it was common, and that criminals in Mexican jails will bribe the security guards for cell phones, and then they'll dial random numbers, until they successfully connect to someone. Then, using a recording of a woman screaming for help, they trick you into thinking they have one of your loved ones, finally demanding money. I couldn't believe it, but as I mentioned before, I looked this up online, in articles, videos on YouTube, and experiences that I read, and they were almost identical to mine. So, that's pretty much the whole story. I never have received a phone call like that ever again, and I now have a filter set up on my phone, which blocks international calls, as well as spam. Has anyone else listening to this had this sort of experience, or do you know someone that might have?
it would be interesting to see if any of my fellow Creepy Fox listeners got a story to share. Last January, before the world went completely bonkers, an old friend of mine came back to my hometown to visit her family. Emily, my friend, had advised me a week before, and I was super excited that we would be hanging out once again like the good old days. I don't know if you care for context, but I'm female, and I was 24 years old when this creepy encounter took place. Anyways, on the third day of her arrival back, we hung out the entire day. We were at the mall, went to the beach for a bit, and then finally in the evening, we went back to my house to watch some movies and gossip. Close to 8pm, Emily came up with the idea of going to get some ice cream, and then heading to the little park we always used to hang out at to watch the sunset and relax. Sounded fun. We had to bask in Robins to get both our favorite, strawberry ice cream, and then we drove to said park to relax. Now, we both love Pokemon Go, so wouldn't you know we were there excited to learn that there are two Pokestops and even a gym that we could play. Fast forward about 20 or so minutes and we're there catching Pokemon, minding our own business, when we couldn't help but notice the sounds of footsteps and shuffling behind us. Bear in mind, the sun had just set, and the park lights had now come on. As we turned back and looked, we noticed a man in a trench coat staring at us, with one of the weirdest looks I'd ever seen a person make. It did make us uncomfortable, and it didn't help that he took a seat next to us and started asking what we were doing. Nervously, we told him we were just playing Pokemon Go, and that we were actually just on our way. Suddenly, the man puts his arm over my shoulder and starts laughing and saying how we were best friends and that he was so excited to see me. Emily was confused, and so was I. I had never met this guy before in my life, and the harsh smell of alcohol in his breath pretty much told me the whole story. Yeah, great to see you too. I nervously chuckle and laugh as I try to pull away. He ends up grabbing my arm and then he puts me back on the bench. Where are you going? We have so much catching up to do. I'm beginning to freak out, and Emily is telling the man to let go of me, but he shuts her down, and then once again focuses his attention back to me. In that moment, fight or flight kicks in, and I choose fight. I ended up punching him straight in the family jewels, and he quickly lets go of me, which gave me the perfect opportunity to get away. What he does in the next moments was even more chilling. He reaches into his trench coat and takes out his switchblade, not before calling me and Emily names I'd rather not repeat here. We booked it, running across the street, where luckily we saw a group of college students our age who were walking one of their dogs. The dog started to bark, and we take this as a sign of relief to quickly point behind us toward the man in the trench coat. We saw him staring at us from the park, and he's got the look of defeat over his face. Well, let's just say the group didn't have to really guess what it was we were running from, as they usher us into one of the convenience stores, and we called the cops. I'm not sure if they ever caught the guy or not, as neither Emily or I ever heard anything else. Yeah, talk about creepy. That was the time we went to play Pokemon Go, and we got chased by a maniac with a knife who thought I was his long-lost best friend. I have been trying my best to figure out what exactly it is I might have done wrong, or what could have possibly have set up this series of events, but as I recount my creepy encounter, I just can't come up with a straight answer. What drives someone to just go absolutely mad? and turn what should be a nice evening of yours of shopping into a nightmare you'll soon never forget. Let's head back to September of 2020, shall we? I was in dire need of some new running shorts, and I had been holding back on purchasing a pair for quite a while. So one evening after work, I head to my local REI sporting store to grab myself my shorts and even stock up on some protein bars. Just as soon as I entered the store and was greeted by one of the workers, I noticed a man who didn't quite seem to fit with everyone else. I'm not trying to sound mean here, it's just that 
he was very poorly dressed. His shoes and pants had holes in them, and you could see patches of dirt and filth on his shirt, and his hair was all nappy and messy. I ignored him as I head over to the clothing section, and while I'm there, browsing and minding my own business, I notice that man staring at me from behind one of the aisles. This awkward staring went on for about a solid minute, and just when I was about to say something, he started yelling at me. You're speaking too loud, and you're being a huge bother to me. I'm there dang confused as I wasn't even talking to anyone. Sure, I was texting my brother to see if he might have needed anything, since I'm already here. But what sort of talking was he going on about? I proceed to ignore him yet again, and that's when I start to walk to another section of the store. He follows me, and then proceeds to grab the shorts I was holding on to, before throwing them straight to the floor. I was talking to you. I said you're making too much noise. At this point, I got the huge whiff of alcohol over his breath, and this is when I started to fear that he might be off his rocker, so to speak. I was scared that he might try to attack me had I said or done the wrong movement. Either way, I politely tell him I was sorry for any inconvenience I might have caused him, which I'm not even sure why I should have apologized, but luckily it shuts him up for a couple of minutes as I grab my shorts and then had to speak to a worker. The one worker I spoke to didn't really seem to care as they just said to ignore him and go about my shopping. So much for caring about the well-being and safety of your customers. Anyways, I picked up some protein bars and then head to the cashier to pay and hope I can forget about Mr. Creepy Dude, but he stood there at the end of the line, staring at me as if I was some sort of piece of meat. Hey, do you see that guy at the end of the line just looking over at us? I told the cashier with a nervous tone. Yeah, do you know him? She responds back. No, I don't. He's just been following me around and giving me a hard time. She proceeds to say it was the first time she had ever seen him, but had noticed he entered the store a little while ago and was acting kind of weird. Once I was done paying, I asked her if an employee could mind walking me toward my vehicle, and she said she'd get someone in for me to wait for her. That was the longest 20 seconds of waiting in my life, because creepy dude comes up to me for one final time, and starts to curse me out and say I was ruining his evening, and that I should never come to the store again. Luckily, some customers came to the rescue, but that's not before a creepy man blows a gasket, and starts going off on the customers too, saying he was going to, and I quote, kill them. That was super scary especially in the way in which he said it, and I still have recurring nightmares in which I see that man. At any rate, I did get some help getting to my vehicle, and I was able to make it back home in one piece. Fast forward a few days later, and I was returning my shorts after not really liking the fit of them, reluctantly of course since I was scared I'd see the creeper, therefore I brought my older brother with me. And while I'm making my return, the female cashier I spoke to on the night of the incident sees me and says hello. I ended up asking her if she remembered the weird guy from the other week, and she mentioned that they called the cops on him, and they ended up taking him away, but not before a scuffle had occurred. So that was pretty much it. Not too sure what was up with that guy, but judging by the whiff of alcohol I got from his breath, he wasn't really all there. I haven't had any other creepy or scary things happen to me. But if I do, you best believe I'd love to share them and hear them on the Creepy Fox Podcast. This is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, and whenever I look back on it, I wonder what would have happened had a friend of mine not shown up in time. Honestly, I really hope no one ever has to go through something like this, because it leaves you scarred for quite a while. So there I was. It's 2010. I am 19 years old and female by the way, and I started working my first job at a local subway that's just a couple of blocks away from my community college. I worked there Thursday to Sunday mornings and I actually quite enjoyed my almost years of worth of employment. I made many friends and gained lots of customer service skills that I had a dire need of since I was always a very shy girl growing up. One friend I met in particular was this really friendly man named Henry. He was a Vietnam veteran and always came every morning to pick up his coffee and breakfast sub before spending about an hour reading the newspaper and hanging out in the store. 
Henry even introduced me to his granddaughters that he would sometimes bring along with him, who would always say hello and want to give me hugs. Honestly, such a wonderful and cute experience. But unfortunately, I'm not here for that. You see, there was one early morning I was opening and I was already in a pretty bad mood as I had returned from a three-day weekend, which saw me having a breakup with my then-boyfriend. So you best believe I wasn't really in the greatest of moods. Anyways, about 20 minutes after opening and just before the rush, a homeless man stepped into the store and asked me if he could use the restroom. I sighed at his request because I knew I would have to tell him that it was for paying customers only. Most people scoffed it off and would pay the fee or go somewhere else. But this guy, just my luck, got mad and said that I needed to make an exception. After much talking and telling me how bad of a person I was for denying him, I finally caved in and said he could use the restroom this time only. Gosh, if only that was the end of my story right there. Hey, what's the code again? He asks me while signaling for me to come over and help. It's 3478. It should work just fine. It was, apparently. But I soon learned it wasn't because he wanted in. It's because he wanted something else. Could you come over and help me? I really have to go. As a reminder, I'm the only one currently in this store, and I'm already starting to get really bad vibes off this dude. So wouldn't you know, I actually started to walk over to him, and I'm just within feet of the dude. All of a sudden, I hear the sound of the front door opening, and it's Henry and his two granddaughters, who instantly said hello. I made the mistake of turning my back on the creeper, and this is when I feel his tight grasp on my left arm. What are you doing? I say, as he pulls me in, but not before I manage to sock him right in the stomach, which causes him to let go. Henry dashes over to the homeless man, and then gets into a wrestling match with him. At a certain point, the creep actually tries to reach for a knife in his pocket, but Henry is able to disarm him and kick the knife away. Bear in mind, Henry's granddaughters are standing with me at the front of the store, and they're watching the whole thing unfold as I'm calling the cops on my phone. Thank the Lord, another customer showed up and was able to help Henry subdue the man until cops arrived. They arrested him, and luckily everything went back to normal just a short time later, but not of course before being left at a loss of words. To this day, I'm very thankful of Henry and his protective training and skills, because had he not shown up, I truly believe things would have gone south really quickly. Anyways, I remained really good friends with Henry and his granddaughters, but sadly I learned just a few months ago that Henry unfortunately passed of natural causes. To Henry, his family, and his grandkids, you are truly loved, and just know Big Henry is watching over every single one of you. So hold on to your loved ones tightly tonight, and remind them of how much they mean to you. I hope you enjoyed hearing my story of Henry and the hero that he truly was. I'm a retired bus driver who now spends his days looking after his grandchildren and relaxing on the backyard porch watching my bird feeder and listening to music. One thing I discovered was your channel, and as someone who enjoys scary stories, I thought I'd write up one of my crazier experiences that I had when I was younger. We're going to rewind all the way back to the late 1980s when I was a young and naive college student. I had been in need of money badly, so I landed a job working as a bus driver after my dad's friend had recommended it to me one day. Little was I to know what would be a summer job would be an entire career. To say I love driving would be an understatement. Anyways, this was about six months into the job, and by that point I'd already gotten used to long hours as I worked in the evenings. Seeing as I worked in the downtown Los Angeles area, I saw many different crowds of individuals. Such was one person in particular that to this day, I'll never forget. So it was about 11 at night and I was making the rounds near LAX airport, picking up passengers left and right and enjoying a cool autumn's evening. When the bus was a solid 70% capacity and almost everyone from what I recall was sitting quietly either looking out the window or reading a book. It was nice and relaxing, until I reached a certain bus stop, one that was next to a Chevron gas station. 
I remember by that point, oh, let's say midnight now, the buzz capacity had dropped to about 10%. So anyways, I recall picking up two guests. A woman in her early 30s and another man who appeared to be homeless. But here's the thing. As the woman approached me to pay, she whispered to me that the homeless man had been following her for the last little while and she was hoping I would say or do something. As I hadn't actually seen anything take place, there wasn't much I could do. So I told her just to take a seat behind me and I'll make sure to keep an eye on him. Besides, I also assumed since there were a few people on the bus, this man wouldn't try anything. Remember, this is a time before cell phones were available to the public, so even if I wanted to, I couldn't call the cops to check up on the man. Yeah, for those of you who weren't around before cell phones, life was very different. Not that I should have to really tell you. At any rate, the bus ride goes unhinged for the next 20 minutes, and more and more passengers are leaving. All that's left by this point is the woman I mentioned, and that homeless man who was sitting at the very back of the bus. The good news was it appeared as if whatever was going on between the two was no longer an issue. However, I was too soon to write him off, because just as we had arrived at the woman's stop, I heard her scream at the top of her lungs. For the few seconds I had looked away, I looked back up in the mirror to see the man grab the woman's purse, and then he starts to book it to the back door. Now I have no idea what came over me in that moment, but it's like adrenaline just took over. I quickly jumped out the bus, and then I start to give chase to the man, who was running across the street to an empty Walmart parking lot. I managed to tackle the man down to the ground and grab the woman's purse, but it's when I get up that the whole situation turns scary. He pulls out a knife from his boot, and then he tells me to hand over the purse. I'll admit, that was one of the scariest moments of my life, and I thought to myself that if I had already come this far, I wasn't going to let this creep get away. But what am I going to do? I chose to run. And yes, there's going to be one person out there that's going to say, Why did you run away, you big chicken? I don't know. You come face to face with a crazed man with a knife and you tell me what you're going to do. Anyways, I'm running back to the bus, where the woman is staring at me from the windows. I'm desperately trying to yell at her to run away. But I guess she was so frozen in fear, she stood in place. To be honest, I was expecting a fight to take place. However, when I looked back for a brief moment, I saw the man no longer give chase to me. He just stood in the parking lot staring at me with a look of complete anger. I don't know what happened in those moments, but it's like something must have clicked in his head. Something like, maybe this isn't worth it, because that was it. I locked the doors, and then I end up driving the woman a few streets down, closer to where I knew where there was a police station. This was one of the benefits of being a bus driver. You learn pretty quickly where all the major landmarks are. In short summary, the police officers ended up driving the woman home, and we did give our statements before I returned back to the main bus station to report everything to my higher-ups. As far as I know, he was never caught, and I never saw the man again. I don't know where that woman is today, but if there for whatever reason is a small chance she listens to these podcasts here on The Creepy Fox, or someone she knows listens, then I just want to relay the message that if you remember me, then I hope you're doing well. Thanks for sharing my story. Hey Creepy Fox, I'm a fan of yours from Mexico and I really love what you do. As I went to university and studied English, I had begun studying here since high school. I found you randomly one day and started listening. Hearing you narrate actually has been very relaxing and you've helped me practice my English. So I wanted to start off by thanking you. With that out of the way, I got a story to share that happened to me last year, before all the major lockdowns, that I think you and your audience will get a kick out of. It's a story that'll remind you that it doesn't matter where you might be, the time, or place. There are always constant dangers, just ready to butt into your normal life. So for some context, I'm a 30-year-old male, and I work for a hotel slash resort in the city of Puerto Vallarta, that's in the state of Jalisco, just in case you're wondering. I believe I've heard a story or two on this channel from creepy experiences in Puerto Vallarta. And it sucks to think that this is a really nice city, especially by the ocean side. Anyways, I've been working here for over 10 years, and I've seen it all. 
People streaking across the pool area, people getting into fights for the dumbest reasons, and even this one time I had a guest yell at me because they didn't like me telling their kids they couldn't climb on the rock formations. I mean, don't blame me when they fall and hit their heads. Anyways, on this particular night, it's about 1am, and the party the hotel was hosting was wrapping up for the evening and coming to a close, as people were finally beginning to return to the rooms. I was pretty much just standing around and helping the cleanup crew put away chairs and tables, when, out of the blue, a guest comes running up to me. Is everything okay? I asked the woman, who was out of breath and panicking, like she had just came face to face with a man-eating shark. There's a guy yelling at the ladies at the front desk, and he's saying how he's going to kill everyone. Admittedly, it was pretty shocking to hear those last few words from her mouth, but remember, I'd seen it all, so I thought. Therefore, as I'm making my way over to the front lobby, I finally get the call over the radio concerning the crazed guest. They describe him as drunk and acting erratically, and the front desk woman said he was tossing some of the displays around. I asked if she had called the police, and they said they were already on the way, but that they were scared he might try to do something while they got there. Well, considering I've already dealt with drunks in the past, I soon arrived at the front lobby to approach the man and ask him if he was okay. His drunken rage suddenly comes to a stop for a brief moment as he just stops and stares at me before calling me every name in the book. Can I really say the things he told me? I guess I'd rather not risk you getting into trouble. So let's just say you wouldn't be caught dead telling your grandmother those sorts of words. Regardless, I'm doing my best to calm him down. And just as it seems he's got to the point, he grabs a shard of a broken vase he tossed to the ground and comes charging at me with a look of complete hatred. Fight or flight immediately kicked in, and I recall everything in those moments going into slow motion. Was I really about to face a drunken man who's got a hold of this sharp object? What if he managed to connect on my neck? or any other sensitive area. Would I ever see my wife and kids again? All of this and more is flashing into my head as my adrenaline pumps me up to dodge out of the way just as he's about to slash at my face. I then proceeded to jump behind him before putting him into an improvised chokehold and bringing him to the ground. A couple of guests seeing the commotion came to help me seconds later and we kept him restrained there on the lobby floor while cops arrived a few moments later. Admittedly, I was pretty shaken up by the entire crazy situation, but I managed to relax once the man was handcuffed and taken away in the police cruiser. The receptionists at the front desk thanked me and the guests, and I told them I was just doing my job and that I was happy they were safe. The police officers also complimented the guests and I on our bravery, and even the manager of the hotel gave me a little plaque thanking me for my service. I was just very lucky that things went the way they did. The last thing I would have wanted was an untrained guest or employee to get physically involved and then get sent to the hospital, or worse, because they try to de-escalate the situation. Anyways, if my story manages to make its way into a Creepy Fox podcast, I want to say thank you, and also let people listening know you should look into getting training in self-defense. Sure, as a security guard, it's pretty much needed, but it doesn't hurt to have it on your resume. It might just save you, and those around you. I work for an authentic Mexican taqueria that's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in Southern California. We're located near the downtown area, which means on the weekends when I work at night, we often get the drunks who come in to get food. Though quite often than not, they're more hilarious than they are aggressive. There was this one time I was working, however, a customer came in and yelled at my co-worker in a drunken state, claiming he was sleeping with his girlfriend, but it quickly de-escalated when a couple of his friends managed to calm him down. Crazy enough, the same guy came in the next day and apologized to my co-worker, which is something you almost never hear about happening. So anyways, I'm riding in to go over a wild encounter that I just had a few months ago when I was working the night shift. That evening, I had been fairly busy when I had first clocked in at 9pm. Customers were arriving in large groups to get their food game on, and I was happily helping make the tacos, along with my two other co-workers who were going to call Kevin and Carlos. Now, as I was approaching 2 in the morning, it was time for my lunch, so I decided to head to my car parked in the back of the building to eat some tacos de lengua I had prepared, and to watch an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh!, 
which I was re-watching for like the fifth time on my phone. I actually remember which episode I was watching. It was the one where Merrick had mind-controlled Joey, and he was dueling Yugi with that anchor high above them. Anyways, that's not too important. Halfway through the episode, downing the tacos with some ice-cold fresh horchata, I hear a bump on the passenger side window. I was so focused on my phone that I actually jumped up scared like a little kid when I heard the noise. Standing there was a tall, skinny man, with no shirt on, and the scruffiest beard I'd ever seen. His hair was all nappy, and it looked as if he hadn't showered in weeks. I recall making a hand gesture like I was waving at him while letting out a nervous chuckle, thinking perhaps he was going to leave me alone once he saw the car was occupied, but he continues to stand there. Well, great. So much for enjoying my food and this episode. As I'm sitting there thinking about what I'm going to do next, he then attempts to open the door, but as you'd expect, it's locked. Try and try as he did, he then moves on to the back doors, but he's unsuccessful. Well, great. What was this guy's problem, I thought. Bang. Bang. I hear at the back bumper, as my car then begins to move. Oh, no way was he hitting my car. I looked through the rearview mirror, and sure enough, he was kicking at it. I got so mad, that just as I'm about to reach for the door to open it, I saw something that sent a chill down my spine. The crazed man had taken out a small knife and was beginning to slash my tires. I can't tell you how scared I got as panic starts to induce a sort of frozen state of mind where for whatever reason, I couldn't move. I don't really know how to best explain it, so let me just say that unless you're in a situation such as this, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. After sitting there frozen in what felt like hours, I decided to call my co-workers who were in the store, but they didn't answer, not that I was surprised. Yes, I did end up calling the cops right after that, but as I was waiting, the man kept banging at my door, saying that if I didn't open up, he would get in by force and take the car away from me. Yeah, I did tell you he was pretty out there, didn't I? Thankfully, as he begins to walk away, presumably giving up, two police cruisers pull up into the parking lot and then I noticed the man takes off running. This was when I stepped out of my vehicle, and I told the police officers that was the man who was trying to break into my car with a knife. Fast forward about five minutes later, and they're bringing the man back to the parking lot in handcuffs. By this point, everyone inside the restaurant had come out to see what the commotion was about, since mind you, at the time, there was only one customer eating, and then my two co-workers, who had no clue as to what was happening. At the end of it all, he was taken away and I sighed a breath of fresh air, knowing that my ordeal had finally come to an end. A few days later, I uncovered that the man was well known in the downtown area for being a druggie and just so happened to have stumbled into our neck of the woods on that evening. Why he was trying to break into my car as I was eating? I guess whatever he was on told him to, but luckily he was unsuccessful. I'm still working there, but I haven't had anything crazy like this happen to me again. But hey, if I have another story to share in the future, I'll make sure to send it your way, Creepy Fox, since you're my favorite narrator. Take care, be safe, and all the best with your recovery on that leg of yours. When you're back at Disney, I'll make sure to come by one day and say hello so I can introduce you to my girlfriend and her sister, who really enjoy your videos too. This scary experience happened to me in 2015. And I was fresh out of high school up here in Anchorage, Alaska. For context, I'm female, and I had turned 18 years old a few weeks prior. As a sort of gift to myself, I decided on visiting my grandparents that live in Mexico City. A quick little background, by the way. My dad was born and raised in Mexico City. And when my dad turned 20 years old, he went on a road trip north wanting to visit the last frontier. It was an adventurous trip for sure. And after spending weeks on the road, he ended up reaching Anchorage. It's here he met my mom, and of course one thing led to another, and I was eventually born. Not that it's too important to my scary retelling, but I just thought I'd bring it up as a cool fact. Anyways, enough of that. I packed my bags, board my flight, and after a long day of traveling that saw layovers in both Seattle and LA, I finally reached Mexico City, exhausted, but happy to be away from home. 
Admittedly, it was a bit intimidating, seeing as I'd never left Anchorage my whole life. But once I was with my grandma and my grandpa, my nerves had come to a rest. The next few days are spent catching up with family members I'd only talked to on the phone and eating delicious and authentic Mexican food. Tamales, pozole, enchiladas, tacos de lengua, my personal favorite by the way, and so much more. Now, apart from me wanting to see my family and hang out with them, I also wanted to explore Mexico City, check out the landmarks, and maybe even catch up on the history. Quick facts, by the way. Did you know? Mexico City was built on top of a large lake. No kidding. It's actually one of the reasons this city is constantly sinking. In order to maintain its water distribution for people to drink, the city has pipes that take water from the underground lake. However, the downside is that it's causing the grounds underneath the city to become unstable. There is the option to import it from the lakes further down below, as Mexico City is at a high elevation, but it's very costly, and by the time the water gets there, it loses about a third of the water. Anyways, I signed up for a tour bus that takes you around the city for an entire day, and also allows you to the option of trying out different cuisines, even doing some shopping. On a Sunday, I got dropped off in the downtown district by my grandpa, and it's here I joined roughly 30 people in this large and comfy tour bus. Honestly, I felt like I was part of a band. Those tour buses were so comfortable, I seriously need to get me one of those seats. Fast forward to about 1pm. The trip had started at 9am, and we stopped in one of the shopping districts so that we could stop, stretch our legs, and even get some food. The tour guide gave us an hour, and by then we had to be back. Not a problem. I knew not to go too far, and I made sure to keep a lookout for the people who were with me on the tour. So after looking at a couple of shops and grabbing some little necklaces for some friends back at home, I stopped by a street taco stand to get me some tacos de lengua and an horchata. Just for those tacos alone, I'd go back to Mexico City in a heartbeat, just without the scary encounter I'm about to go over. So like anyone, when you've had a nice cold drink and hot temperatures, you're bound to want to use the restroom, and I was no different. I tried to find a place to go and pee, but everywhere I was going either charged or had you buy something. I was almost going to, but then a lady who saw me asking told me there was restrooms behind the store that was open for the public. Sure, it may not be the best idea to go down a little quiet alleyway to do your business, but it would be quick. What's the worst that could happen? I made my way down this little alleyway, with walls on both sides and some boxes filled with shoes from the local business surrounding me, and I reached the little building with the restrooms. They actually looked pretty fancy and clean, which ended up relieving some of the stress that I'd bump into some stranger. Regardless, I pee, I wash my hands, check my phone for the time, and then I exit the building. Too bad there is now an obstacle blocking me. A man. Just a man. Forty years old. With a large belly, mustache, hat, dress shirt and jeans. Staring me down like I was an alien. I try to get past him. But he just steps in front of me and tells me to be quiet. I'm telling him I have to get going, but he just keeps standing there. Bear in mind I'm speaking to him in Spanish as I'm a fluent speaker. So I don't know what his problem was. Well, turns out he has a problem with me, because the guy took out a switchblade and then demanded I hand over my phone, purse, and any other belongings I might have had on me. Just picture this sight. You're in a country you've never seen before. You're in this alleyway away from people, and now you got some complete stranger pulling out a knife on you and telling you to hand over your belongings. What do you do? Well, let me tell you what I did. As I'm standing there, arms shaking, palms sweating and heart beating out of my chest, my body gets a mind of its own, because with all my might, I kick this guy straight in the family jewels. Big mistake. The guy loses it and tells me how I was going to pay, which was the message to me of, girl, you better run now. And so I did. I was running, screaming like I'd seen a ghost, and I managed to grab the attention of some police officers, who thank God were walking nearby. They saw me, and all I did was point in the general vicinity of where the man was chasing me from. They went after him, and as I looked back, I saw the man stumbling back into the alleyway, not really sure where he could have gone as it was a dead end. Needless to say, I didn't stick around to find out more, as I was already running late for the bus, and I didn't want to ruin everyone else's tour. Yeah, not exactly the greatest thing to bottle up of almost getting mugged in an alleyway, 
but it is what it is. At the end of the day, I got back home to my grandparents and I had a complete nervous breakdown, finally venting from the incident. For the rest of the vacation did see me a bit paranoid, but after spending some time with the family, I was able to eventually forget about the scary aspect of my experience and move on with my life. So here we are all these years later. I'm glad I can share this with the rest of the Creepy Fox crew, in which I hope you'll learn some valuable lessons from me. If you do plan on traveling to a different country, make sure you're with somebody at all times. Yes, there were the people I was with, but as I never told anybody about where I was going, they had no clue what was occurring. Also, it's better just to pay the small fee and use a restroom inside a restaurant or somewhere where there's going to be plenty of people, because you don't know who might be lurking around in the shadows trying to mug you. Lastly, when in doubt, run like heck and defend yourself at any means possible. When you hear the word vacation, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Being able to get away from your Monday to Friday work schedule, or school schedule in my case, and just enjoy yourself. Being able to surround your life with delicious foods, fun activities, and trips to the spa sounds like the perfect recipe for relaxation. And while my vacation did start off as just that, little was I to know the scary experience I would have that left me going, wow. Alrighty, so like any story you've heard here on the Creepy Fox, allow me to give you some context in order to paint a better picture. I'm female, 30 years old currently, and I decided to go on vacation to San Francisco in 2013, which would make me 22. I was a huge fan of Paramore at the time, and they would be playing at the Warfield Music Venue in downtown SF. I had already planned on going to San Francisco later that year, so I thought to myself, why not just go a little bit earlier? I can knock two things out of the way, and see my favorite band perform too. Nice. Along with me would be going my fellow Paramore fan and cousin Eric. He was 24 at the time and just like me, enjoyed attending concerts and listening to loud music in his room. Anyways, when we arrived in San Francisco, we had no idea how long of an adventure we'd have just to get to the Hilton Hotel in the downtown district. Once there, we checked in, put our bags in our beds, then went to grab some late lunch. After we spent the rest of the day exploring the nearby districts, before calling it a night. Fast forward to the next afternoon we arrived at the concert venue and we waited for about four hours until finally we were let in. The show was insane. I can't tell you how awesome it was to see Haley, Taylor and Jeremy and the rest of the Paramore crew performing their greatest hits, including songs off the newest album they had released that year, their self-titled one. Now there was a bit of an issue at that show. Haley, the lead singer of the band, was sick that night so the crowd was helping her sing the songs, which Eric, myself, and the rest of the fans attending had no problem doing. Fast forward to after the show, both Eric and I are still full of energy and excitement, and we're beginning to get pretty hungry. We remembered a little convenience store we had passed on the way to the venue, and we decided to head on over to pick up some chips, sodas, and maybe even a couple of sandwiches. Now, during the day, there was a lot of foot traffic. You'd see people in their business suits walking to work, and teenagers and college students hanging out and just doing whatever. But at night, it's a completely different story. Apart from how much more quiet it was, you did notice an increase in the drunks, and even the druggies, as we saw a couple of people smoking out of a glass pipe, and even one guy who injected himself with a needle. Ouch. Now, I'm not one to judge. Everyone has their own story and their own background, and unfortunately, there are a lot of people who struggle in life, but I don't think that gives you an excuse to attack others. What am I talking about, you might be asking yourself. Well, once we grabbed our snacks from the convenience store, we began to notice a man who we originally saw sitting a few feet from said store drinking an alcoholic drink out of a brown paper bag begin to follow us. It wasn't until we made a couple of turns down streets that we would make the confirmation. Now, this wouldn't have been an issue if it wasn't for the fact he was getting a lot closer to us and saying some things that were giving Eric and I the chills. He kept repeating over and over that he was going to stab us and that we were dead meat if we didn't stop walking away from him. 
We're still a good three or so minutes from the hotel, mind you, and we just kept saying amongst ourselves that if we just ignore him, he'll leave. That never happened, because now he starts to yell at Eric and I, calling us various vulgar names and saying he was going to kill us. Eric was just about to say something, but what the man does next sends us running like a pack of zebras getting chased by a hungry lion. No joke. Guy reaches into his jacket, fumbles around with something, and then he takes out a knife. He starts to yell again, and then he goes into a straight up sprint. As you can imagine, Eric and I are caught off guard and we immediately start to book it toward the Hilton Hotel, wondering just what we had done to cause this random man that we don't even know try to come at us with a knife. These next moments feel like an eternity, but luckily it was only maybe 20 seconds. As we turn the corner of where the Hilton Hotel is and can see it with our very own eyes, we looked back for a brief moment and we saw this guy go flying. Turns out he wasn't that great on his feet because he bumped into a part of the sidewalk that was a little misaligned and elevated and he does a complete faceplant on the concrete, not before the knife goes flying underneath the car. Eric and I hold back on saying anything as we continue to run and reach the hotel. Here's where we saw a security guard and we instantly told them about the man who was chasing us just moments prior. The security guard walked out of the hotel, only to return about 10 seconds later saying that the man we described just got back up and turned back and disappeared. Not before cursing at the girl with the red dyed hair and the guy with the denim jacket. That would be us. Anyways, to say we weren't left scared and a bit confused would be quite the understatement. I look back on it now, and I sort of feel sorry for the man. Just a little. More so, I'm just left wondering what causes someone to get so mad at you that they begin to chase you with a knife. Were we really that bad at people for trying to get some late night snacks? I don't know. I just hope he got some help, and his life has since turned around for the better. From 2002 to 2004, I worked at a small gas station in Southern California while I attended community college. I'd say one of my favorite benefits of working there was it was close to my house, so I never had to worry about driving as I was about a three minute walk away. This meant I would often have my friends from my neighborhood come and visit me and keep me company so that I wasn't alone. At least that's how it was when I first started as it was my first job and I was a nervous wreck. Now, what I am here to talk to you all about is an incident that happened while I worked the night shift. It had been a fairly quiet evening and I was just standing there behind the front counter, all alone organizing some of the displays of chips and candies. As I listened to the music on the radio, this was around Christmas season, so they were playing Christmas songs. From the corner of my eye, I watched as a man in an oversized black hoodie barges into the gas station convenience door. I was taken aback as he pulls out a pistol and now he demands I start emptying the cash register. I'm all but sweating bullets at this moment as the robber comes walking over to my side of the front counter. He tells me to snap out of it and to start handing over the money. Bear in mind the pistol is out and he's within point blank distance. No way I could just run away. So left with no other option, I went ahead and opened up the cash register as I hand over what little was in there. Roughly $300 from what I recall. This wasn't enough as now he demands that I tell him where the safe was and that I open it. I feared that as even I had no access to the safe. It's a timed safe and if you don't know how those work then basically they're programmed only to open at certain times. This was something I kept trying to explain to him. Luckily as more time starts to pass and I see him start to get anxious. He decides just to book it out of the gas station convenience store, leaving me there in a complete shocked state. After what seemed like an eternity, but was really maybe 30 or 40 seconds, a customer walks into the store and asks what had just happened. With my voice shaking and palms sweating, I give him a quick spark notes version. And luckily he's nice enough to keep me company as I call 911. Police officers were sent out to find him. Meanwhile, two officers came to the gas station so they could review the security footage and get my description of the incident. I did actually get interviewed by a news station, KCAL 9 if anyone in Southern California knows that station, and I actually appeared on the TV. 
Yes, luckily he was caught and arrested in connection with the robbery. And it turned out he already had a history of robbing gas stations and convenience stores. So that was all those years ago. Here I am today, living a normal life with my two daughters and beautiful wife. Nothing as remotely scary as that incident has happened to me again. And I hope it remains that way. As the last thing you want is to be working and then have somebody barge in with a gun. I used to work as a gas station clerk from 1999 to 2005 in southern Ohio. Over that course of time, I had many run-ins with all sorts of individuals. Nice people and families who were on road trips and in need for a bathroom break. And even the occasional weirdo who would try and shoplift and then get mad at either myself or my fellow co-workers for catching them on the act. But as much as I could tell you about my many boring evenings alone, counting the minutes until I could go home, I'm here to tell you about one customer in particular. I don't even think that's the right thing to call them since they actually never bought anything. So okay, I do remember it was in the fall season and I was just getting ready to head to work. I was the night shift guy, working from 10pm until 6am the next morning, and after I'd finished feeding my pets, two hamsters and a couple of goldfish. I bid my parents adieu, hopped into my car and make a short 15 minute drive to the gas station. As I pulled up, I noticed, apart from a couple of vehicles having gas pumped into them, what looks to be like a man with dreadlocks, large oversized hoodie and wearing a poncho, pacing back and forth by the large ice machine. I could also visibly see him drinking out of a large tequila bottle. I'm not sure why, but any of you out there get a strange feeling anytime you see someone or something that appears like it doesn't fit? It's not that you're trying to judge or be a bad person, but it's like your sixth sense is giving you a warning. That's the sort of vibe this guy was giving. Either way, I tried to ignore these feelings as I step out of my vehicle and then I begin walking over to the building. As I got closer, I'm able to hear the man whispering to himself and even what sounds like him saying something to me. I look toward him confused, and when we are having brief eye contact, I get the chills. I could feel the malice and anger through his eyes, and they sent chills down my spine. But if that wasn't what worried me, it was the little pocket knife I could see him brandishing with one of his hands. I think he noticed that I had seen it, since he quickly puts it back in his pocket, and then he begins to walk away. Well, so far, what a strange way to begin my night. I walked into the gas station and I said hello to my co-worker, who we will call Susan. She was an older lady, mid-fifties, who I honestly sort of considered like a mom or aunt. She would always bring me homemade food or things like cookies and brownies, as I remind her of her son. That's another story for another day. But regardless, I asked her if she had seen the man I'd just spoken to, and she says she had. Apparently, he walked into the store about an hour earlier, and he had asked to use the restroom. Susan also sensed something about him, but as not to stir the pot, so to speak, she left him be and he walked out. While considering it appeared as if he was intoxicated, and I had noticed he had a knife, I decided it was in the best interest to at least notify someone. After all, if someone is clearly out there drinking hard liquor, and they have a knife on them, you never know if that person might act aggressive. I know there might be some people who will say what a rat I am, but for the better I decide it's better to call the local police department to advise them of the intoxicated man and that I'd seen a weapon on him. So with that, as we awaited their arrival, I kept looking out the window to see if the man might be out there. I did see him moments later. He was yelling at a driver who had just gotten into their vehicle, who drove off, and for some reason that appeared to have sent him into a fit of rage. Through the small opening in the front door, I could hear him yelling obscenities and saying he was going to kill that driver. Hmm, very weird, but it gets worse. The man suddenly stops and then stares over in my direction. I don't know if he had noticed me at first, but as he gets closer to the building, these suspicions become answered. I start to step towards Susan who is behind the front counter as the man walks into our little store and starts to cause a fit. He's yelling at Susan and I, and basically going off about the most random things. He was mentioning how he was abducted by higher beings and how he was apparently being set up by the government. Yeah, it was pretty weird. As I'm trying to de-escalate his anger, 
since he's growing visibly aggressive. He takes out the knife I saw earlier, and then begins slashing at some of the boxes of food and bags of snacks on the displays. Through his fit, he kept saying he was going to kill us, but mind you, not once did he get too close. As Susan and I are standing there, visibly shaking, and slowly beginning to back up toward the back room, never taking our eyes off of this man, we notice two police cruisers pull up into the front of the store. How quickly both of them run in, as they now instruct the man to drop the knife. This was probably one of the scariest things I'd ever seen. Was I really about to watch firsthand as he was slain for going after an officer with a knife? I think the Lord had never came to such a violent ending. I don't know, but something in this man's mind must have told him through all his drunken rage that it was better off not to escalate things further. Well, unfortunately, he never dropped the knife, and as he got closer to the officers, who were still telling him to drop said knife, thank goodness they go with a non-lethal option and tase him, quickly dropping him to the floor, soon placing him in handcuffs. Honestly, I never had so much adrenaline running through my veins, but as the minutes passed, I began to calm myself, as did Susan. At any rate, that was really it for that experience. The owner slash manager did show up, and after we gave our statements, the man was taken away. It wasn't until a bit later that I learned that the man who was arrested was apparently already a troublemaker, having only recently been let out of jail six months earlier on possession of illegal controlled substances. Talk about the wrong way to restart your life. In some way, I sort of feel bad for him. Just a little. Here's to hoping he's since gotten clean. He's moved on to brighter and better things.